Would you all please stand and join me in a moment of silence? Thank you. We have some special guests this evening who are going to assist us with our, with our meeting, and I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent Dr. Kerbel. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. I want to welcome all of my friends who are watching the school committee in their pajamas. So I'm <laughs> jealous. I want to introduce two students who are going to help us today. The Pledge of Allegiance. I want to introduce Max Donicky and Max. Stand up, Max, so we can see you. No, no. Wait, Max is a fifth grade student in Mr. Earl's class. He is the secretary of the McCarthy student uh, government. He is, his favorite subject is history, and he enjoys playing lacrosse. Max also likes to ski for fun. He likes to participate in the reenactment of battles as part of his love for history. He likes to play in, he likes to fool around in the backyard, showing off, and it, it is amazing the knowledge he has in history. And Siobhan, Siobhan Galvin. Siobhan, Siobhan is a fifth grade student in Miss Manning's class. She is vice president of the student government. Her favorite subject is social studies, more specifically history, and she loves to swim. She also likes acting and is part of the McCarthy Drama Club. She is part of two different voice acting groups and has been part of a YouTube video on voice acting. And, well, thank you, um, Siobhan, and I also want to welcome um, Michelle Zatoli, the principal of the McCarthy School. As you can tell, Mayor Betancourt wasn't able to be here this evening, so that's why the students waved to him, because we know he's watching it at home. Okay. Moving on, first item of business, approval of minutes. Do I have a motion for the approval of the minutes? Motion to approve uh, minutes from January 20th, 2020. Okay. Motion made 28th, by... 28th, I'm sorry, January 28th. Okay. Motion made by Mr. Hockman, second? By Mr. Arnotis. Any discussion? Okay. Roll call vote? Yes. 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 Okay. Approval of bills. I'd like to make a motion to approve warrant A number 4408, dated February 11th, 2020, in the amount of $47,082.36, subject to audit. Second. Okay, motion by Mrs. Carpenter, second by Mr. Olympio. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve Warren B, number 4410, dated February 11th, 2020, the amount of $867,354.89, subject to audit. Second. Motion by Mrs. Carpenter, second by Mr. Olympio. Any discussion? Okay. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. Moving on to continued business. Um, the first item regarding the MSBA Higgins project, uh, it is still going through the final, final pieces of completion. Um, as you heard me say, we're looking at purchasing microphones and we're moving on to getting appropriate signage for the property. So there are just a few things to close out and those are coming soon. Uh, the next item was FY20 budget updates and actually I believe we left this till this week um, for Mr. Scanlon to give an update or for Dr. Kerbel. So I will turn it over to the two, two gentlemen next to me. Uh, Dr. Kerbel and I have been working very closely on the FY20 uh, budget. We have a, a good handle on the numbers. There's a number of uh, variables that we're dealing with as of right now. I've covered some points with the finance uh, subcommittee. I think overall we're in fair shape, uh, but we need to investigate a few more things and provide an update to the finance committee at their next meeting. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon. Are there any questions? All right, next item, the uh, Welch School Feasibility Appropriation. Just to give you an update, um, presently the advertisement has been placed and is receiving applicants for the position of owner's project manager. There will be a walkthrough of the building for those people who are interested in serving as an OPM. And the, uh, the subcommittee of the building committee will be uh, preparing to conduct interviews of the qualified OPM uh, companies, and at that time we'll be coming back with a recommendation on the top three, and then a, a process in conjunction with the MSBA will take place in order to select the owner's project manager. And this is all on schedule. We've got a very rigorous schedule because we want to make it for the April 9th um, board meeting of the MSBA, at which time we will be able to then hire an OPM. So um, I would like at this time to make a very public thank you to uh, Mr. Daniel Doucette, the city purchasing agent. He has done an incredible amount of work on this process and, and brought us through to today where um, there are a significant number of people interested in the project and uh, it's really going very well. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Mr. Miko. Not a question, just a comment through the chair. Ms. Dunn, thank you for your work on this as well. Oh, Appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Next item was Emerson Park bus routes. Mr. Hoffman, we put it on this week thinking that the mayor would be able to address it. I don't know if you want to continue with it this evening or was it something you wanted to have the mayor present for? Um, I, I've had some conversations with Dr. Kerbel on this. I'm happy to wait till the mayor come, is able to join us for a meeting. It's not anything that is pressing, um, so if we can put it on the next agenda, that would be fine. Okay, we'll put it to the next agenda. All right, uh, next item, the Carrie E. Murtag Memorial Scholarship, Mrs. Carpenter. Mrs. Dunn, I think that was something we were gonna discuss mm -hmm. as a, um, a separate item once you had some more information. Do you wanna hold? Actually, I can give you the information that I have. In the past, when the school committee sponsored, a, it was called the School Committee Scholarship, and we're going back to 2004, 2005, the school committee members themselves contributed to a fund for a scholarship, and they determined the criteria for the student to be awarded that scholarship, and it would be awarded at graduation. And um, there was no, um, no specific uh, time frame I believe that's something that we could work on ourselves and I'd be happy to help everybody with that. Mm -hmm. But if, if you would like to do that, um, I personally I would, be, I would be in favor of that. I think that the school committee giving a scholarship says a lot 
to our community, and I think naming it after Kara Murtag is really a, a very nice tribute to her because uh, we we couldn't have done what we've been able to do without her. You know? Right. Yeah. No, I agree. I think the intention <clears throat> I had going forward with this was to create something in her legacy. Mm -hmm. um, I was very impressed with the the Peabody Education. Um, foundations criteria and how they set it up mm -hmm. um, but having another one I have no problem with okay so maybe we can um, set up some guidelines kind of get it all jotted down on paper and kind of Bring send it, it out and work on it sure. and we'll, we'll keep like it on yeah. definitely <laughs> whatever your wishes are I think that okay. sounds good all right any further discussion no. okay thank you um, this was buses for the DECA students into Boston on February 27th. Mr. Miko? Yes, thank you. Through the chair. Um, I believe we were waiting on some information from central office. There was a little bit of a holdup, but other than that, we can take a vote on the buses for uh, students going to DECA. I believe there's two buses one way, and um, if we're ready, I'll make a motion to... Um, Move forward with that. Although Dr. There, was, there was there was a question about cost. There's no cost for the buses. Okay. Oh, that was it. Thank you. Yeah. So there's no cost on the buses <laughs> to um, to DECA's competition because it happens during the day, right. and that was the that, that was a holdup. So I'd like to make a motion to um, pay for well not pay for buses to send to bu send students on two buses one way to uh, the competition on Fe February 27th. Okay, you've heard the motion by Mr. Biko. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Hockman. Okay, any discussion? Mr. Hockman. Yes, thank you. I'm happy that we got this clarified that they were able to transport these students for the competition without any cost to the district or to the students. Can we just confirm that there's also no impact on the busing routes for the students that aren't competing? There's no impact on anybody, right? No. Dr. Lord? No. Very good. I'd like to ask for an amendment. Go right ahead, please. To send them in on the buses with very good wishes for success. <laughs> Love that amendment. Thank you. Okay. All right. On the motion, roll call vote. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Next item is mine. Field trip forms, etc. I think it was. I think it came up in the discussion about the busing, um, and I, I appreciate all the forms in the file, but I, I think we're all set at the moment. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. So thank you. If anybody wanted to discuss any of those, please feel free. But I do think it was related to the DECA trip. Okay. Next, we're going to have public participation. Mr. Miko, can we use your microphone? It's working, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. It's you. working. Okay. If at any time anybody's microphone doesn't work, just share. There's, there's an issue with our mics. Okay. If anyone would like to come up and speak, please feel free to do so. You give your name and address. My name and is Michelle Baker. And mm -hmm. I'm at 13 Sunset Drive in Peabody, and I'm the mother of Paige Baker, a student at Higgins Middle School. Okay, welcome. So I know you see all these papers, and I know everyone wants to go home, so it's not as long. I'm just going to skim through it. Nope, don't worry. Um, oh, can you pull the microphone close, though? There we go. Okay, this had to do with the Friday before Martin Luther King Day, um, where there was an incident in the art room here, and one of the students claimed that their phone had been stolen as long as one of their friends. They found the phones, and then the student claimed that she was missing more than $200 in the phone. So it, the question, the students was not asked any questions. The teacher told the, the students if they're, um, nobody fesses up, then she's calling the school resource officer, which she did. Um, and I want to make note that when my daughter texted me at 135, I immediately came up to the school. So Sunset Drive is around the corner. It was here within five minutes. As soon as I came into the office, I informed um, the secretary that I wanted to see the principal and that my daughter was not to be searched without me present. So this went over a course of time. Um, I said to the secretary, why were, were you not informed? And she said, you expect us to call 30 children? And I said, yes, I do. 
So this went on. Um, I texted my daughter. I told her to tell the administrators that you would like me present as you have a right to privacy and they could call me if there was a problem. I was in the office. So my daughter asked if the teacher could call me because she didn't want to talk back or cause a scene as that is against the rules in the handbook. Um, I assured her I would be up there soon as I was in the office and if they asked her before to go into the class to say she was not giving consent without her mother present. Almost 15 minutes after my arrival, I received a text stating that she was just searched. I went to the hall to make a phone call and at 2.05 my daughter informed me that the principal was in the room. Um, eventually there was an incident in the office with one of the secretaries that I addressed with Mr. Busey. Um, so I went and I met the uh, Mr. Busey and Paige at the end of the stairs. I asked him what was going on and he stated that a student's phone was stolen and when it was found in the closet that there was over $200 missing from her phone case. Um, first of all, I was astonished that this was based off of a student's claim that there were no questions asked of her, like where, who saw the money, who did you tell you had money, where was she, is she sure it was lost in that class. Um, you know, it was just her and her friend's phones that were allegedly stolen that were found in the, in the closet, but there were no questions asked of her whatsoever. Um, I asked how they determined that the phone and money were stolen, and he said that the child was extremely upset, so the teachers were trying to do the right thing. Again, I asked the principal why the parents were not notified. Same answer, do you expect us to call 30 parents? We proceeded to debate on what is a lawful school search and the parameters of such a search. Um, I was told that I wasn't um, pretty informed on what is allowable in a school. Um, my daughter was with him at the time and I asked my daughter who apologized to you after they searched your things and she said nobody. And Mr. Busey did at that time apologize to her. Um, I was going to take my daughter home for the day. This was later in the afternoon and um, she decided that she wanted to go on and her English class had started so she went up to her English class. Um, immediately after I got a text from her that the other kids were telling her that now they thought it was um, suspicious that she was pulled out and they thought that she was the one who did it. Um, I was contacted by, by one of the teachers after school who told me that this was a collective decision between herself and two other individuals, I'm sorry, three other individuals, and um, I'm sorry, and she um, admitted, you know, she said she would, she would apologize to Paige if that would make her feel better. And again, I explained to her, just like I did to Mr. Busey, this is not from Paige, this is from myself, I am her advocate, and that is my job as a parent. Um, and I told her what the other kids were saying and she said, well, that's because you came to the school and pulled her out of class. And I let her know that I only wouldn't have to come to the school had I been notified and a legal search wasn't being performed. Um, I emailed the principal as I told him about the interaction I had in the office and I hope that the adults involved would understand that this is not my daughter and I hope that they, you know, we're, we're going to, um, uh, treat not treat her any differently basically and he emailed me and he stated that he understands my point of view and there are many possible explanations for what could have happened to the money as well as <clears throat> that they will be conducting a post-mortem on the whole event to make sure that any necessary adjustments were made should something like this come up again he stated that this will in no way come back on her and she's certainly not the only one in the same boat he also went on to say that the secretary was asking me to step out to meet him which she was not, she was asking my daughter's name and then asked me to go out and wait in the hall because she needed to talk to the other woman in the office. Um, I sent an email to Mayor Betancourt as the ex officio of the school committee asking what his take was on the situation and that I'd like to discuss it with him. I heard nothing back, but it was a long weekend and it was the afternoon on a Friday, I knew that City Hall was closed. When my daughter returned home, I got the entire story and basically what happened was two friends stated that their phones were stolen Phones were located in the art room cl closet of the same class. One girl claimed that she had over $200 missing from her phone case. The teacher told them to fess up or the school resource officer would be called and things would get much worse. Then each student was taken into a closet and told to hand over their phones to the same sex administrator who took the cases off to see if there was any money hidden. The opposite sex administrator stood in the doorway. 
While my daughter emptied the pockets on her person, the administrators, administrator searched her jacket pockets and backpack. Although my daughter was not told to remove her shoes, some students were told to do so. The students were brought to a different closet and asked questions by the school resource officer. Additionally, the teacher asked Paige to be her witness while she looked for money in the closet where the phones were found. Again, shining a light on my child when that should have really been another adult. A week went by and I left a message on Mayor Betancourt's voicemail asking him to contact me to discuss the email I had previously sent to him. Again, in good faith, I waited patiently until the Peabody Patch article was, came out. Um, it was an inaccurate article. I've expressed that to Mr. Kerbel, my displeasure with that. Um, I was told to refer back to the principal, which I did. And just to share some quotes, one was, parents of the students in the class were notified by administrators. Parents, parents were notified, but after the school day had ended. The response I received was, I was not, no I, and I never received anything, and I was told that was because I was already there. Then there was a quote, there was no lockdown and police were not on the premises. 30 children were not allowed to come or go from a class and the school resource officer is a employee of the Peabody Police Department. The response I received was the school wasn't on lockdown and they didn't call the police department. So it was a matter of semantics, I guess. <coughs> it was not that he couldn't, he, couldn't answer my questions because of privacy issues or confidentialities. All answers were, I don't know. This tells me nothing had been looked into or discussed, and that was about a three week period at that point, two and a half. Two officials took the time to speak with me and said they had heard rumblings about the search, but not nearly as in depth as the information I provided implied it was pretty much brushed off as nothing. One person forwarded my email to the superintendent and one school comment committee member was kind enough to at least acknowledge my email. The student was asked by the teacher the following week if anything was found, which I would think the teacher would know if they did. The student said no, and that was the end of the discussion. Maybe this should have been elaborated <coughs> on and let the students know that nothing came of the search and saying things would be handled differently if this ever came up again. This is what I was assured of. To top things off, my child unfortunately came down with the flu and was out of school in a solid week, Monday to Friday. Now it is speculated that she, is, she was suspended for this. Children have enough issues navigating through school. Now this will be my daughter's to carry on her shoulders because of the bad decisions were made by adults who are supposed to be guiding her. I actually left it up to my daughter on if she wanted to drop this. She said everyone already thinks she did it, so it doesn't really matter anyway. I will always advocate for my daughter. She should know her rights. She's entitled to them, and she needs to know that although she didn't want to talk back to the teachers, she had every right to not fear repercussions because she wanted to ask her to have her parent present with her. I will encourage her to be a smart, independent woman who does her research, knows right from wrong, and isn't afraid to assert herself in a respectful way. Unfortunately, I didn't encourage her to apply for Essex Tech, so this will be behind her for four more years that she will have to deal with. Though no one related, through no one related at the school, I was informed that this is being investigated by the Peabody Police Department, specifically by the school resource officer who was involved and an additional officer. To date, I have not spoken with anyone in this inv investigation, even though I was present while this was all going on. I think it's a tremendous shame that this has, so many resources have been wasted trying to sweep this under the rug. This would have taken a few minutes just to sit down with me to address my concerns for any future student. So since this will not happen, I do have some comments I would like to discuss. And one is, you know, Fourth Amendment rights are taught in eighth grade typically. This should probably be taught in the beginning, maybe of the year now. And if people would like to read New Jersey versus TOL, it's a Supreme Court decision on what can be searched and what cannot. And you have to go past the part where they say that particular case they had a right to search because beyond that it tells you what the parameters are. I don't think anybody is familiar with reasonable suspicion. There is no uh, probable cause in a school system, but there is reasonable suspicion. And you cannot say there is reasonable suspicion of 30 children. It's ridiculous. The scope of the search was far too wide. And I think it's a shame that this even happened in the first place. And I'm happy to share if anybody else wants any more court sightings, I'm happy to share them with anybody, um, but I definitely think that there were a lot of lines crossed 
And specifically when I came in and said, I do not want my child searched, and it was made sure she was searched prior to bring her down. There was a good 15 minute span there, and that should have been seen too, but they waited till then. So that is, um, I would be happy if, to give my information to anyone. I'm sure Mr. Hawkman have seen my story many times um, in my comments because there was a lot of confusing information out there. There was incorrect information. Um, people were not looking for phones. A lot of people think, oh my God, if that was your child's phone, I don't care if it was your child's phone. It, it doesn't matter if it was my child's phone. It wouldn't make any difference in the world to me. That is not eminent danger and it is not her dealing drugs or anything else. It's a telephone that was allegedly stolen that they found and then they were searching for money. Had they found money on another kid, how would you prove it was hers? There's just, there was no good outcome for the entire thing. There was no thought put into this. I think it was very specific why the police officer did not do the search and he had the administrators do it. And because he knew that there was no basis to search those. So that is my spiel. And I hope you'll take it into consideration to develop a new policy on how things like this are handled in the future. And with that said, I'm very proud to say that my daughter is brave enough to come up here and tell you how this has have affected her and what she went through. Thank you. Hello, I'm Paige Baker. I live at 13 Sunset Drive, and that was my mother who just talked. <coughs> um, so this event that I'm about to talk about happened. Um, well, I want to talk about it because of what happened. Um, in our class, um, two girls said that their phones were lost, and then soon after that was said, it was stated to be stolen. Um, they, both girls then found the, girl, the phones in the art closet, uh, and one of the girls said she had lost 200 plus dollars. In her, that was in her phone case. Um, the girl who, the girl who lost the money looked for the money around the class and could not find it and ended up starting to cry. Um, the, the art teacher said to the class that whoever took the money to just fess up now and they would not get in trouble. Um, then soon after, soon two administrators came up and started to search the kids also giving the class many chances to s say they did it or know who has done it. Um, at this point, I have been texting my mom. One of the girls who was searched um, said that they went through her bag, jacket, and she had to take her shoes off. I had my bag on my lap and all my belongings on me. Then the school police officer came and um, I got called into the supply clo closet after a little while, and the supply closet is like a s almost, it's kind of small, but it has a bunch of shelves in that. Um, the girl administrator took my bag and my reached for my like winter jacket. I got that search. I had to take up, I had to go through the pockets that were on me and uh, she took my phone and went through my case. Um, the whole time the guy administrator stood in the doorway, uh, I got to go back to my seat while I was, I got to go back to my seat, but while I was getting searched, the class was told to walk around the class and look for the money. When I went back to my seat, I was still holding my belongings. Then I got asked by the teacher to stand in the art closet to watch her look around the closet so she had someone with her if she found the money. Then a little bit after, I went back to my seat and the police officer um, brought me into the closet to ask me questions. I thought he was going to search me. Um, he said I could put my bag down and he asked me a couple questions like, um, like if anyone was talking about who had the money or if they had the money and I answered no. 
I also asked before I got called or searched, I asked the police officer if the girl went to the bathroom beforehand because maybe she lost it then and how would we know because we weren't allowed to leave the room. Um, also before I got searched, I talked to the art teacher and I s asked her if we were going to be searched in a separate room because I was embarrassed because I had lady products in my bag. Um, after I got questioned by the police officer, the principal came in and the principal stood around for a little while just looking around and a, the school, like the classroom, sorry, the classroom phone rang and the principal took me out of the class and brought me downstairs because my mom was there. My mom talked to the principal and wanted to take me home but I stayed and went back to my regular class, which was English. And finally, uh, the other kids who were in my art class came in my English class. I asked one of the girls what happened after I left the class, and she responded saying the class was suspicious of me and thought I took the money and all of that. And so, Throughout all of that, now that I left the classroom, the kids did think I did it, and I did get sick, like my mom say, said. Sorry. <laughs> um, I. It doesn't really like. It does really like matter, and it does need to be at least talked over with the teachers and the administrators saying they need to talk over things before they take action. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. The committee isn't allowed to address anyone that speaks at public partic participation, but your issues will be looked at and there will be action taken and a response. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Hello, Mrs. Henry. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> um. <laughs> Mary Henry, 15 Fay Avenue, Peabody Federation of Teachers. I come for something happy that I think everybody will like here. Um, uh, we are um, the AFT, and actually it's a national movement to celebrate Public Schools Week on February 24th to February 28th. And we were hoping that this could be a community-wide event where our teachers, union members, the school committee, the community join together to celebrate uh, the wonderful things that we do in public schools. So I was hoping that um, on the meeting that's scheduled currently for February 25th, we could take some pictures. There's a toolkit that I have sent to Dr. Kerbel and to Dr. Lord just today, so <laughs> give them a minute to read it. But um, just to celebrate public schools and the wonderful things that we do for children. So I wanted to let you know about that. And there is a website. So I brought my computer. It's called lovepubliceducation.org. And you can register on that website. Five different screens open. Here it is, the last one. Uh, it's you know public school proud. You can have your community register and to show your commitment to our nation's public schools. And that is all I would like to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Henry. Is there anyone else that would like to speak at public participation? Okay. Thank you all very much. Moving on, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Kerbel for his superintendent's report. Okay, thank you. I just want to make a quick remark on the Strategic Plan Committee. And 
Excuse me. Excuse me one second. I just asked of the vice chair a question. So normally I would just say it to everybody, but I wasn't asking everybody. I had to make sure that I was on the right road. So it's no big deal. The strategic plan committee, we had a strategic planning meeting um, that was a continuation of the work that was started in the fall. And, um, and we had a, a good showing. We, uh, moving forward with the strategic plan, it looks like we're going to pick up probably six or seven more people that would like to join our subcommittees. So we're meet, meeting February 27th or the 28th. It's a Thursday. 27th. 27th on a Thursday. And then there's two days, two Thursdays in March. And then I'll just keep you apprised. Um, probably on the side through my emails about some of the things we're working on. I'm really pleased where that's going. Um, <clears throat> I think I talked to you about my impression about the high school. And every time I go to the high school, uh, very impressed with staff, students, um, just the culture, just the, um, everyone's nature. It really is, it really is a, a great place to be. And so Dr. Lord and I talked about, we wanted to highlight, uh, I think, some of the things that's happening, that's happening at the high school and so there's really two parts of this. First part has to, be, uh, has to do with AP for all. And then the second part is a few testimonials that I'll have, one from a parent and one from a student that just graduated from college. Actually, he just got a law degree. And so I'm going to turn this part over to uh, Dr. Lord to talk about the um, high school highlights, part one. Thanks, Dr. Kerbel. Just want to recognize our high school staff here, Michaeline Haig, um, Mr. Quist, and George Hyatt. They're going to be here to speak with us for a few minutes. Maybe if you could, can come up and say a little bit about our AP programs. Um, I want to highlight the 21 high AP programs that are currently running at the high school. Um, and it's some of the strongest AP programs that you can see on the North Shore. I don't believe there's any other school with as many uh, AP programs that are, that are going on currently. <coughs> well, we'd like to have every student in PBD think about as they're going through the high school is to experience one advanced placement class before they graduate. Part of our charge is to become college and career ready for all of our kids. And if you experience an AP curriculum, you know, regardless of how you might do at the test at the end of the year in May, if you experience an AP curriculum, you'll have a really good idea of what it means to have a progressive and college-bound experience. So AP for All is a program that's been going on in some other states, uh, New York in particular. And what I'd like to do is have um, Ms. Haig and Dr. Hyatt come on up and share a little bit about some of the AP programs um, that we might be able to get engaged with uh, for AP for All. Welcome, and thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. So, Dr. Lord, any special order that, he, that you want us to go in? So. Uh, no, we can just run through the uh, chart up here. Uh, we're trying to get the AP program into lower grades. Um, we are trying to capture the eighth grade. We're not being uh, secretive about that. We want to make sure the eighth grade students are aware that there's a pretty aggressive AP program that they can get involved in right when they come out of high school. Um, some of you may have heard of the After Dark program that Essex Tech is running. It's in the afternoon. We're going to be strategically scheduling the master schedule to have AP classes the first four periods of the day so that if students in their later years, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, would like to go and try Essex Tech, they can leave and they can go there for the last three periods of the day and then come back to the high school and be a part of the high school experience but also have that uh, experience at Essex Tech if they, if they want to. So they don't have to go there. They can stay at our high school and then go to Essex Tech if they like. If they do want to go to Essex Tech with their passion, that's great, but we'd love to capture the eighth grade class and have them come up here. Part of the conversation we've been having is to allow the eighth grade students to get into AP programs that would be of value to them as ninth graders. And I think that's where we're going to be uh, starting our conversation. Um, Dr. Hyatt, you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. A number of years ago, we started a program 
uh, Mr. Sapienza was actually the principal at that, at that time. And we made a, it was a major push to be able to have as many of our students participate, again, your idea, in at least one uh, advanced placement program. And it was successful in that we were able, in the science department, to pull some targeted, it was a small number, uh, ninth graders into the biology program. And since that time, it's been 11 years, it's been phenomenal. Uh, just the study skills that the students develop, having to stay on point every day, every night, consistent focus has allowed for them to have some nice placements in universities af af after four years. It seems it's not just one AP that our students want to be able to take advantage of uh, once they get a feeling for this. And it's a pacing, and again, that very, very strong focus. Um, they like the success that, that they have. So we're trying to bring back to uh, our community uh, this idea that uh, everybody participate. We want to be able to start early. Again, we'll continue with the AP biology for a good number of freshmen. Even open up AP environmental science to them if they're interested. And uh, this should take us into some good places, I think. Am I going? Okay. <clears throat> I think maybe I need to give a little bit of history of um, the AP program at uh, Peabody Veterans Memorial High School. Uh, basically, we started with uh, only two AP courses in 1980 under then principal Mr. William Welch, who had also been an assistant superintendent of schools before that. And he really wanted to turn Peabody High School into the, what he called the flagship of the district. And the way to do that was to start with AP English Literature, as there was not an AP Language course at that time, and um, AP US History. And so I had the honor of writing that AP English Lit curriculum and have been teaching it since. Um, and. Uh, Andrew Metropolis was the one who wrote the U.S. history curriculum and taught it until he retired as well, too. So the thing back then, even, anyone who wanted to take AP English was allowed to take AP English. Yes, we had set up some gateway, uh, some of the department heads had set up some gateways in, as far as grades are concerned in order to get into the course, but in the English department, you want to be in my course, come on in. Okay, and basically we found that those students who were motivated to take those courses were the ones who often were the best students in those particular courses. So since 1980, English anyway has been um, open both in AP language and AP lit for anyone who wants to take it, but those courses aren't offered until the junior or senior year. So how did we address this idea of trying to get more students involved in it? And under uh, Principal Sapienza and continuing under Principal Buckley, uh, basically all of the people in the English department were trained in something that was called laying the foundation, which is a pre-AP course. So um, we don't have pre-AP at the high school. That's an institutionalized, formalized kind of program. But the strategies and techniques and many of the different approaches that we learned in um, that particular course, as we were trained in those things, we have incorporated in the very strong curriculums that we do have of in the freshman and sophomore years and the junior year as well, too. Those courses, particularly in the CP1 and honors level, definitely prepare students for going into the AP courses that are offered in the English department at that point in time. We have been discussing the idea of incorporating uh, pre-AP, but that's another issue for another time because it involves budgets and, and money and things of that sort as well, too. However, we can be really so proud. Come to Peabody High School, for goodness sakes. In the last many years, our students have been one of the top in the state as far as the three, fours, and fives that they have and the qualifying scores, and even in getting ones and twos, that is an accomplishment according to AP as well as according to our experience too, for when they go on to the colleges or the training in various organizations that they have later on. As a matter of fact, one of our AP language teachers just received a couple of days ago 
an email from a student that I would like to share with you. As, <clears throat> and um, this is what, the student is a junior um, at a college, well, I'll tell you, it's at, um, where is she, St. Anselm's. So, and this is what she writes. This week, my college has had the privilege of hosting all of the major Democratic candidates for CNN town hall events and the debate Friday night. Last night, I had the amazing opportunity to attend the CNN town hall, which featured Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Andrew Yang, and Tom Steyer. During the town hall, I found myself analyzing the rhetoric surrounding me, from who was selected to ask certain questions to the clothes each candidate chose to wear. I know from your class, that, my, that every decision had meaning behind it. For example, I noticed how Warren specifically mentioned women and daughters more in her speech than anyone else in order to capture the attention of her female audience, and how Steyer did not wear a suit in order to appear to be the common man to his voters. I could go on and on. I just want to thank you for teaching me how to analyze and explore the rhetoric that impacts our daily lives. I think understanding the rhetoric and reasoning behind what politicians and even commercials are advertising to the general public is an important skill to have. It is a skill that my peers and friends at school are sometimes lacking. I am grateful to have taken your class. Attending the CNN town hall last night would have been a much different experience for me without it. And then two days later, I received an email from one of my students who is also a junior in college. And uh, basically, I'll just read one line from her. that I'm writing to ask you if I could possibly interview you for a project in my education class at Assumption College. You have been a teacher that deeply inspired me and taught me so much. And she often would say this about the class itself. And it was a class that was supposed to be AP but got changed to an honors, a whole big change around it. But those students were allowed to take the AP test anyway, and she did. And as I remember, this girl got a two on the test, but just to know that she has gone this far from that particular kind of experience, this is the kind of opportunity that our AP classes offer to our students as they start at the freshman level and move on up through the courses that are in all the different departments. And when you put these courses together with the other courses that are offered in our departments, these students can actually specialize in a subject in which they have an, enter, uh, an interest. And that gives them a platform, a scaffold, for moving through the um, majors that they choose when they go beyond, the college and career readiness aspect of things. We really need to make sure that we protect these courses, that we support them, that they're given the resources that are needed in order to continue. And we need to also celebrate and applaud what our students do here. Because so often, as we know, our interests go to students who have very special needs, but these students have a special need. They need to have the prompting of that critical thinking, that delving into the higher order thinking skills, that discussion of ideas and share it with a variety of students within the classes because, at least in English, we have a wide range of students that are in our particular classes. And that range, this is students helping each other as well as being involved in discussion with the teacher as guide. They are connecting to students in the other classes because we generally run three AP Lits, three AP languages, different teachers for all of those particular classes, different curriculums approved by AP, but the central idea is what is the important literature and culture and writing and discussion aspects that come together in order to prepare students for going beyond what we are. This is a program that I wouldn't have been in Peabody as long as I've been in Peabody if it were not for some of the kinds of programs that we have here, not just our AP program, but many of the other things that we can be very proud of offering to our particular students. So. The work that George has done with um, opening up AP to biology is something that we all are a little jealous of. Um, certain constraints keep us all from doing those kinds of things. But certainly, come here, students. Basically, we can give you an education that will level that playing field, hopefully, with all of those great prep schools that are around us. But if you come to Peabody Veterans Memorial High School, you will be just as well prepared for going beyond our corridors and our halls, and to succeed wherever you may choose to go from here. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Haig. <laughs> I just wanted to highlight one other thing up there, that um, there are a number of ESL students that are coming into our schools that have proficiency in another language as youngsters. 
We are looking to have them come in as ninth graders into a level three or a level four Portuguese or level three or level four Spanish class as freshmen and might even allow some of them to jump into an AP language as a freshman because they already know that second language. To complement that for our primarily English speakers, we're looking for a seal of biliteracy where the students can get an endorsement on their diploma that says to potential employers and potential colleges that they, will, uh, they are proficient in two languages. So that will be coming up some point in the future and it relates back to that AP language pathway uh, in honor of Spanish. Mr. Quist, you want to say more? Yes, and I'm probably going to get in trouble, but I'm <laughs> going to say it anyways. The, uh, I think we're at a point in Peabody where we can do great things with our AP program, but I'm always concerned about the access to the, to the AP program itself. The costs have continually have gone up. Uh, more and more of our students uh, that are on free and reduced lunch. There, is to, there still is a cost, even though there are reductions. Uh, this year we have 282 students, which is just over 20% of our, of our high school class that are taking AP exams. We're giving out, I think it's 484 exams come, come the spring. But my concern has been, and you also mentioned uh, English language learners, is that the cost, have I think the cost is becoming prohibitive for even students and families that are not on free and reduced lunch to be spending four or $500 on exams that may or may not impact where they're going based on the college or university's own program and what they will accept and not accept uh, is, is significant. And for those students that are on free and reduced lunch, even though the cost is greatly reduced, and uh, Dr. Lord has done uh, has helped with a, a grant that we were able to get for about five thousand dollars, and through MIE, another I think it's a, just over two thousand dollars will come back. Uh, the cost for our exams, at taking that out and taking every advantage of every cost that we can cover. Uh, it's still going to be in excess of $30,000 this year for, for AP testing. And as we're encouraging more and more of our students to take them, uh, exams are in the morning, in the, in the afternoon. We're having many of our students now, more of our students who are on IEPs, who are taking advantage where it's no longer a barrier. But where sometimes that barrier could come is that a test that might be three and a half hours is now five hours for these students and in their afternoon test it goes late into the afternoon early evening and uh, and there is a cost to that for those that have that come in proctor with that as well uh, in the past the, the money for the AP exams has been money in money out the uh, the parents have paid or the families have paid and from that is where we've been paying off the uh, AP bills each year but if we really want all our kids to have that opportunity if we really want our students to to make this leap of faith we I think we need to make it accessible for all our students and uh, and uh, what I'm saying I have said to people whenever I'm asked about it, but I haven't said it to Dr. Kerbel yet, so I'm saying it, I'm, 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 I'm just saying what I believe is that we could really make our program the envy of, any, of anybody if we can somehow take down that access barrier of finances. There are some districts that do pay for all their students to take AP exams as a matter of course. I would hope that we might try, even I know budgets are always difficult, but to look at is there a way that, a, that Peabody can step up to that as well and make this available to all our students. And then that takes out <coughs> the private schools, it takes out other schools that, who may offer some, but we're eliminating those barriers and we're encouraging mm -hmm. our students, not only in word, but in deed. Right. Now there's a, another compliment that folks should be aware of. Um, my wife, for example, went to a uh, high school and her best friend passed with a five on six of her AP exams and she walked into high school and um, walked into college as a sophomore and her family only had to pay for three years worth of college at the time. These are huge savings for families over time if they can do well on these AP exams and be successful as they're walking across the stage in high school. So folks should be aware of that when they're planning for their college experience. If they can do well on these AP exams before they leave high school, they could potentially save themselves thousands and thousands of dollars by doing well. The other thing that isn't mentioned up here is our dual enrollment program, which we've just started and we've talked a little bit about. Our teachers are going to be co-teaching with college professors at Salem State, I mean, um, at uh, North Shore Community College. 
or is it Salem? No, Salem State. It's Salem State. There's going to be a professor of politics coming over to work with one of our um, history teachers, and an English teacher is going to be coming over from Salem State to work with one of our uh, writing teachers, and they're going to be co-teaching. And so long as our students are exposed to the college professors for a certain amount of time, they'll get a transcript from Salem State that says they've passed college level curriculum material at this level. Now that's not designed for AP, that's designed for the kind of student that wants to stay in the neighborhood, that wants to go to North Shore, that wants to go to Salem State. Those are the folks that they're trying to capture. We're hoping to get more and more and more dual enrollment programs going, but again, it's a question of doing a shared experience with the, um, with the, high, with the uh, colleges and the high school in the region so that the professors can come over here and spend some time with our kids. And the last thing I want to share with you is if we get the confidence of the u local universities in our faculty to deliver their curriculum, our teachers, we have about 40 teachers who could become adjunct professors at the local universities, and we could be teaching dual enrollment programs with our teachers during our school day so that when our teachers teach our kids during our school day, they walk across the stage with a uh, Salem State credit transcript. So those are some of the things that we're headed to really accelerate the academic program at the high school. I want to thank everybody who listened, and particularly thank all three of you uh, for, for sharing part of your evening with us to highlight some of these great things at the school. May I add one thing here, Fire too? Away. So, Okay, um, within the AP courses as well, too, um, teachers are not just preparing students for the test. Um, obviously, that is the goal to um, achieve uh, at the end, but we're also addressing some of those things about looking at the colleges in which you have an interest and what are the kinds of things that um, they are accepting as far as scores with AP, because every college does it in a different way. So we do try to do a number of reality checks in no matter which AP course um, you that student may be in. And also how to look at how what benefits uh, can come from making your choices of colleges overall. And um, my daughter had a similar experience. My daughter only took two APs in high school, and uh, the college she went to, she got a three on the US history exam, they gave her three credits. She got a four on the uh, English Lit exam, and they gave her six credits for that. But not all colleges do that kind of thing. So some make you take other courses in place of, maybe the intermediate course rather than the entry course overall. So we do, in guidance and in the teachers in these courses, also try to look at the practical aspects of how students can use these things to benefit them. So, so it's not just, oh, let's delve into the content and let's discuss these wonderful things and do these great experiments and get ready for that exam and all of that. It's also about how does this benefit you on a day-to-day -day basis and how does it benefit you in thinking about your goals, your global thinking, your pathfinding, and uh, a number of the other things that make you the person that you are. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, just to highlight the practical application of this, the current 9th, 10th, and 11th grade students are meeting with the guidance staff at this time to select their courses for next year. They've been able to do so electronically in Aspen. The rising 9th grade, the current 8th graders, the middle school, will their portal will close this Friday, so the students that are currently 8th graders can continue to select their courses for the rest of this week. When we get back from February vacation, Mr. Quist and his team is going to come down to the middle school and meet with the 8th graders and have them select the classes that they want to take for next year. And we're hoping that some of the rising 8th graders will jump into some of these opportunities. If the uh, current 9th, 10th, or 11th grade students and their families want to change their requests based on what you've heard this evening, contact your guidance counselor at the high school. We're going to be locking up the requests for all the high school by mid-March or so. We're hoping to get the master schedule done around April break so that the students can meet their next year teachers before they leave for summer. We want to have step-up days so they can, you know, check out all their classes and, and meet with their teachers and talk with them and get their AP materials. Most of the AP classes have some work to do over the summer, um, and hopefully they'll get all that done before the end of the school year. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee members? Mr. Hartman? <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Dunn. Uh, your enthusiasm is welcome. and. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, some of our meetings aren't um, always so joyful, and it's always a pleasure to hear three of you speak about the accomplishments taking place at the high school. Mr. Quist, um, I appreciate your uh, advocacy for the students who um, should be taking AP exams and the roadblocks that stand in their way sometimes. Um, life is real, and it happens all the time. Uh, Mr. Hyatt, I'm glad to see that you've um, been quoted 
on the big screen. <laughs> <laughs> we want every student to run with the big dogs. There you go. <laughs> but uh, in, in all seriousness, I will make a motion um, to have uh, Mr. Scanlon generate a report to capture what it lo would look like financially for the district to ab absorb um, AP test fees. I will say it's a much more complicated subject matter than you're, you're leading us to believe, but as a good advocate, you're drawing us in to take a look at it, and then we'll, um, because there are reimbursables at the college level, particularly based upon scores um, and things like that that I think we'll have to flesh out. But I'd at least like to have the information available as a budget consideration for 2020-2021. So move. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Anotis. Okay. Discussion on the motion? Okay. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Is there any other? Mr. Anotis. Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight and advocating for this program. I can speak firsthand uh, to how beneficial it is. Fairly recently, I know you know that. Um, and you know, as I'm sitting here, I'm just having flashbacks to the late great Larry Bertram. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, and I'll tell a quick story. She never let me forget it. Um, <laughs> When we had the, as I'm sure you still do, the practice exams, I took yeah. several of these. And I will say, just quick, um, to the parents and students out there, they're worth taking a run at because you don't know when they will benefit you in the long run, depending on what you do after high school. I did save plenty of money in my college career because of some of these um, history classes. But just when it comes to English, and again, Mrs. Bertram, on the practice exam, I got it too. And then she made that well known to me. And by the end of the year, I ended up with a four. Yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I was thinking about it recently, actually. You know, in my other, in my full time job, I do a lot of writing. And um, I had never expected to be in a position where I'd be writing as frequently as I am. But I consider it um, a strong skill I have now, mainly because of the work that came from this AP program. And I often find myself looking at other people's writing and kind of finding my way through it a little bit. And I always think back to the folks at uh, high school. So thank you for what um, you presented here tonight. And I, I do hope that we can continue expanding this and encouraging folks to look at it and supporting it. Thank you. And you don't have to pay a private school because it's free to come to PBDI. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> and Mr. Olympio? Oh, no. oh okay. Um, I would just like to add a, a huge thank you to the staff for carrying on with the AP program. And thank you, Dr. Ward, for encouraging this growth into the younger grades. That program, I remember when, it, when we had the big kickoff up at the high school, and Peabody began winning all kinds of accolades for the opportunities that our students were being given and that they were taking under the AP program. It was, it was absolutely huge and truly beneficial to the students. I'm very proud of my children, my own children, who attended Peabody Veterans Memorial High School. They took AP exams, and one of our children actually did take and, and earn enough uh, grades in AP to start a semester, a semester ahead, which was phenomenal. But one of the best things about the AP coursework, and of course, you know, it's tough to have a mother that's on the school committee because we we grill the kids about what's happening and how's everything going. And I asked them for feedback once they got into college, as far as how how is the high school preparing you for that. And every one of the kids told me, Mom, those AP courses got me ready for college. Because when they went into a college classroom, they had learned, as you said, Mr. Hyatt, study skills, consistent, focused. Those courses have a very, um, a very distinct style. And all of my own children, and I polled their friends too, they all said the same thing. They felt very ready for their classes having taken the AP courses. And for some kids, even if they don't get the college credit, it really is more the experience 
the knowledge, the practice that they got. They're taking a college style course in high school so that when they go off to college, they're not surprised. Many of their classmates in college were really surprised by the work needed, not the kids who came out of the AP program. So it benefits everyone. I'm, Mr. Quist, I'm just so glad you have continued to advocate for the finances on this program. And um, I think one of the first conversations I had with you was about the AP program and the, and the, the cost for students. And I'm glad we're going to look at it because we do need to help all of our students be able to take those exams. Anyone taking more than one course, the, the cost can be prohibitive for some people. And there are ways of lessening that cost. Um, I was just at a, a <coughs> conference in Washington, D.C., and I was really thrilled to hear that under the ESSA, Title IV, funds in Title IV can be used under certain circumstances to fund an AP program. They were giving us all kinds of ideas. I'm gonna send them over to you. You already know about them, but I know I was excited to hear about it because it was a gateway for, for kids who can't afford it or think they can't afford it. That actually is the bigger problem. People think it's too expensive, and it's not, because I know at the high school, you're already working with people to make it possible for them, and as a community, we need to make that a possibility for everyone. So thank you again for oh, coming and for giving a good presentation. Dr. Kerbel. Oh, thank you, thanks. Yeah. These three, oh, I'm sorry? Oh, no, no, after Dr. Kerbel. Oh, do I go, John? No, go ahead, okay. after, after you. You should see them when they're awake, how passionate <laughs> they are during the day. They're unbelievable, that's why they're here tonight. So um, Dr. Quist, um, you, you mentioned the number $30,000, say 30. Say thirty to forty thousand dollars would take care of. But for, the, for this year, with uh, the two hundred and eighty-two students, including uh, students that are on free and reduced lunch, and that the bill is approximately taking the college board deduction, the bill is thirty-eight thousand four hundred and oh. something. However, we do have Dr. Lord was able to encompass some money through a grant, I believe, up to five thousand for students that identified free and reduced lunch, MIE. Uh, Mass Insight right. uh, only covers certain cl courses, but I believe that's another, I want to say, $1,700 to $2,000. I, I, the, the figure just escapes me at the moment. And uh, one of the, unfortunately, one of the things that the state did uh, a couple years ago is they used to provide that difference for our students on free and reduced lunch. Now they have cut that back and have limited to just certain subjects that they think uh, more STEM oriented versus, for example, the social studies classes and things of that nature. And that has been cut back even more so now. So the reason why I ask is that we, we have a lot of industry in Peabody. A lot of people watch the school committee or they're interested. And then you just never know when there's that industry out there that says, you know what, we'll sponsor those kids every year. So that's what we're looking for. Maybe someone, maybe a business, you never know. So I'm putting the ask out there that if somebody's interested in helping us, call my office or send me an email. This is common practice, business, wanting to invest in schools. M most of the waivers in, uh, in the programs that I'm aware of, uh, those waivers come from business. Uh, sometimes large businesses, sometimes just very, very small but it, it is a way to, to really help a child because it allows for them to be challenged. That, that's what we're doing. We're, we're, we want to push our kids. We want to challenge them. Uh, good program, you're tested at the end. It measures your abilities. I mean, you, you get that answer in July, you know? One, two, three, four, five. And there's a lot of smiles because there's a lot of, there's a lot of fours and fives out of our high school. Thank you. Mr. Olympia? Yeah, through the chair. Thank you all for all you do, really. It's, it's incredible. And, you know, it really breaks my heart that, again, cost comes up and it's a barrier for some students. And, but a presentation like this, uh, maybe this Dr. Lord, you could help us with this.
But something like this uh, being presented, like with the eighth, when students are in the eighth grade with parents at some type of assembly, would be extremely helpful because I do not think a lot of people funny you should ask. realize <laughs> that. Yeah, um, there's a, a live scrolling <coughs> slideshow that Mr. Quist and I, several teachers, Ms. Uh, Haig was at one of those presentations. We presented the eighth grade families three times: okay. once here at Higgins, once at the high school, and um, Mr. Quist and his team did a, a third one last last Wednesday night, right? I mean, you can call any time or look at that slideshow online. It gives you a really good idea of all the AP programs that are out okay. there. And um, I hope we've sold Peabody High to the community here. That article that you saw in the paper yesterday, yeah. that says it all, man. Yeah. I mean, uh, we just blew away the NEASC commission. It's like, it's like giving a presentation to the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the White House. Yeah. These are 40 <laughs> educators from all over New England, and they were like, wow, Peabody is ahead of the curve. And people are going to be coming to this school in the next three or four years just to see how we did it. Right. I mean, vision of the graduate, getting report cards out there, practical skills that kids are going to need for the next 60 years of their lives. If we can get a, tra we got report cards going. Our goal is to get a transcript out there for every kid so that when a kid is looking for an employer or a potential college five, 10, 20 years from now, it'll say, I'm a team player. I'm proficient at being a team player. I'm an exceptional global thinker. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an exceptional um, artist innovator. I'm an exceptional pathfinder. These are the skill sets we want the kids to walk out the door with. Not just the ABCDF, which is what they're going to see, but also the skills that they're going to need for the rest of their lives. And you said, I think you said it the last time, these things aren't, yeah. they're intended in school. Well, they are in school now. They're in our school now. And part of this too is where the stakes you know, tuitions are just through the roof, and you almost, I mean, you almost have to make a business decision early on. Yeah. As a student, you know, how much debt am I going to incur in the future? So if they're made aware of that they can save, you know, thousands of dollars potentially, again, it's a, it's a decision that these children and parents to a degree have to make very early. And uh, it's just great. I'm glad that there is a uh, you know communication and with the yeah. parents and we really want to people are aware of this. Have so. them call us. I mean, the, the guy. Do you know, remember what day? What you, when is your team coming down to the eighth grade? When we get back from break? I believe it's either I, we're going down Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to pick up anybody we missed on Wednesday or Thursday of when we come back from. Right. The break. So uh, rising ninth grade families, take a look at your Aspen portals. You can make all the selections for your classes there. Uh, get help from the. Um, staff here at the, at the middle school for how to make those selections. We'll lock those up on the week we'll get back. And we want to give the eighth graders about four hours at the high school on the first day of exams. Our seniors and uh, I mean, all of our uh, students are going to take their first exam on the first day of exam and then they're all going to go home and then we're going to have the entire eighth grade come up to the high school and go through their day. So the eighth graders That's will right. also get to experience what their school day will start like in September, and they'll work out all those uh -huh. issues with the classes and all the conflict. We want the kids to walk in the door next September ready to go, and they know their classes, they know their classmates, they've been talking with their friends over the summertime. That's what our goal is. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Miko. Thank you, through the chair. I just want to thank you so much for coming and for advocating for students, and I was lucky enough to be at the, uh, right. at the assembly, as my daughter will be uh, heading to the high school next year. And uh, it was just an incredible presentation. And when this came up, I just looked up at it and I said, wow, this is awesome. And, and to, to Mr. Olympio's point, this is an investment in your you know, four years after high school because if you can get into an AP program and you can place out, you can save thousands of dollars. Um, and it's, a, it's just a great program. So I just want to thank you for advocating and, uh, and being here. And um, you'll never get in trouble for advocating for students. So uh, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in, in, t in eight hours. <laughs> Okay. Um, in your packet, uh, I sent you the Student Opportunity Act. Could you take that out? I'd like to take you through that. So in your packet is a handout that looks like this. Does everybody have it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm going to do is take us through the, the SOA, as we call it. And um, 
I'm going to try not to get too wordy or too detailed, but then I'm, I'm mindful of how much time this may take up too. But I just want you to understand the act, make sure we're on the same page. So we know we get Chapter 70 money. Um, Joe Scanlon can I'll fill in if I start, talk, if I start talking nonsense. But we do get money from the state. This is um, through the Student Opportunity Act, another 1.2 plus million dollars that we will get. And we have to account for the funds and where the funds go. And it's, um, there's some parameters about the funding of um, the different things that we're looking for. So if you look at page two, Right, is everybody with me so I can just go? All right, so on page two, uh, I'm looking at the, you know, towards the end of the second paragraph. It says, closing the achievement gaps is a collective work for the next decade, and the SOA will fuel our efforts to ensure all students achieve at high levels and are prepared for success after high school. The reason why I'm highlighting that is that getting ready for the budget, um, I'm just gonna be bold and be able to say, if we want Peabody to be a great district, okay, then we can't be asking our uh, teachers to be begging for interventionists to help students who are at tier two and tier three. We have to give everybody the tools they need to help students. We have to close the achievement gap early so that they can take the AP classes at the high school. If we don't close achievement gaps, kindergarten, it widens in first grade, and then it just gets harder and harder, okay? So if you look at, um, so the, the paragraph right underneath it says, it is critical that district resources support student subgroups as the legislation is intended. As part of the SOA, districts are required to submit three-year evidence-based <coughs> plans aimed at closing persistent disparities in achievement among student subgroups. You all got M uh, MCAS scores, okay? The subgroups don't feel better than that. Their actual scores are actually more deficient, okay? So in order to help students with proficiency, we have to help them at every grade level, and I'll be more specific later on. Um, so as, you, as we go down further, one, two, three, four, the fifth paragraph, halfway through, at the same time, it's critically important that all districts use their SOA plans as an opportunity to ensure that strong programs are in place to support the needs of student subgroups. I want to close the achievement gaps, meaning the state gives us $1.2 million to help close the achievement gap. We can't do it if someplace else Money is, no, we start off with a structural deficit. We don't have enough money to cover health insurance. Well, we got this other $1.2 million to help with that. That's not the purpose of this $1.2 million. Okay. If you, if we go to page four, it says at the very top, basic overview of the template and requirements. It says there are four commitments Intention focus on student subgroups. The second one, adopt, deepen, and continue specific evidence-based programs to close opportunity and achievement gaps. Three, monitor success in reducing disparities in achievement among student subgroups. And four, engage families, particularly those families represent student subgroups. Are you getting the gist of it so far? Okay. So now we have to submit a a short form because we got less than 1.5 million and those, the plans are due on April 1st. So now, I'm just gonna highlight a few things, page five. It says, focus your evidence-based program selection. And so there's a menu of 17 options, we're gonna go to that. Here's the second bullet. Thoughtfully engage your community. I met with the guidance, the, uh, the guidance department of the counselors this morning, talking about what their needs are. 16 people, Dr. Christie <laughs> was there since 5.30 this morning probably. 
So I met with uh, those folks early and they talked about the mental health of students and the need to help students and families. Do a few things well. So you're gonna say, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? There are 17 strategies the state recommended. We can't do it all, but we can do a couple of things well. And I'm gonna be able to present that during the budget. Focus on implementation. This is the last bullet. Be concise. Thoughtful commitments that will be backed up by high quality implementation. Okay, page six. I'm gonna skip over. Oh, okay, there are, on page six, these are the 17 evidence-based program examples. First target, enhance core instruction. Okay, so I highlighted number two, <coughs> research early, research-based early literacy programs in pre-kindergarten and early elementary grades, okay? So if we say, well, look, we want to really help early literacy, and we want math interventionists or ELA interventionists, so we're targeting, we're, we're looking at K to five, okay? Number four, supports educators to implement high quality in curriculum, and then five, expanded access to career technical education, including after dark programs. So later on, when I talk about you know, the needs of the district and how to address those needs, we're talking about math curriculum, a new math curriculum, and we're talking about a math coordinator to provide uh, coaching. At, right? at the high school, if we're talking about a new CTE program, that's what th that meets these, that meets um, this bucket. Okay, I'm going to sk skip to number uh, page seven at the very bottom. Certifications. Now, if you get a chance to read all of it, I think it's pretty interesting stuff. <laughs> but you get to see what the state really wants you to focus in on: closing the achievement gap. <coughs> can't do it without early intervention. You can't do it with a math program from 2009. Can't do it with an English ELA program, Journeys, from 2010, right? This is 2020. So certification. One of the things, uh, I'll read it early on, it says, we have to certify that we engage stakeholders as specified by the law. So it says each plan must be developed by the superintendent in consultation with the school committee and should consider input and recommendations from parents, guardians, and other relevant community stakeholders, including special education and English learner, parent advisory councils, school improvement councils, and educators in the district. All right, so I started the rounds this morning. We're gonna to have to meet with um, school councils. Right? We're gonna to have to engage in a dialogue but we'll do that, some of it I'll do online, all right, so that we have to do it, um, so we can, when we get here, we can be, be focused or right on target. Um, we'll have to, of course, meet with, um, you know, other stakeholders, members of um, different unions, and, um, and I said the right thing, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I did it on purpose. <laughs> Um, so there are other stakeholders we really have to include, you know, uh, I, think, I think parent councils, PTO, P, uh, presidents. And I think that's, that's it coming to the end. I attached all the other forms. It just gets to be repetitive. The forms aren't that long. It's short and sweet. However, there are some recommendations and at some point, the recommendation from the state says the school committee should vote on, I'm on page 15 if you're interested. The school committee should vote on the district student opportunity plan as the plan will have budgetary and policy impl implications. Districts will be asked whether the school committee voted and if so, the date and the outcome of the vote, okay? So it's going to be a, a, a little bit of a balancing act because on one hand, FY20, we're, you know, we may be at a structural deficit, so that if you move over to 2021, and I'll let um, Joe Scanlon 
talk further if I'm, if I am not clear enough. So if we go to 2021 and we roll everything over, that means you're rolling over the same program and it's gonna cost you certain percentage for salaries and certain percentages for step and scale, all right? So if we had that money and we start off 2021 with like we have now, okay, then we can use the, the um, Student Opportunity Act to get the things we want to make an impact, okay? Um, I've already generated a list based upon the needs of the principals, all right? Uh, and Joe asked a question. The first question Joe Scanlon asked in our interviews with them, what is it that you really want that will make a difference in your school? They told us that. Lines up pretty well with the Student Opportunity Act. Some things don't. That has the money to pay for those things. We'll have to come up someplace else, or we can't fund those. But the things that make a difference are here. I'm gonna give verification from a different stakeholders, all right? I'll share that with you and ask you to give input. And then we should be able to move forward with our plan that way. Okay, any questions about this? All right now, any comments? Thank you for indulging me. It wasn't that long, was it? You're fine. Yeah. Long, no. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kerbel. Will this be something we'll, we'll put on, on, on the agenda? It'll be on, every, it'll be on each week, right? Okay. And then mm -hmm. we may have, I may have to, um, what we may do is, and for the superintendent's report, it would be the only thing on the report. Mm -hmm. So we can just focus on that instead of having this laundry list of, of things. Very okay, good. all I'm asking the school committee to do is make sure that you familiarize yourself with the SOA. Right. Okay. Mr. Hockman? Thank you, through you to Dr. Kerbel. Thank you for the um, synopsis of the SOA. Uh, is it my understanding that you're gonna need a vote or we need to take a vote by April 2nd, 2020 for the appropriation of the allocation we're gonna receive from the state through right. this? Yes. So we're looking at about six weeks, and one of those weeks is a school vacation yeah. week. Um, it's a pretty aggressive um, time frame, and, and um, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll get it done, but I mean, I'd like to be, I think that we should get involved um, a little bit sooner rather than later. Absolutely, I agree, uh, absolutely. So, so let's, let's um, perhaps when you're setting up some of these meetings with some of these stakeholders, um, yeah, absolutely. Get an invitation out so that those of us that have an opportunity to attend, perhaps do so. Absolutely. Okay, Mr. Miko. Thank you, through the chair of uh, the committee. Um, thank you. I appreciate the uh, presentation on that. Um, in past years, our final budget hasn't even been established until or completed until May. I believe last year it was a couple of weeks into May. So I do have questions about. Um, utilizing those funds if, if our budget isn't isn't finalized by hypothetically the middle of May and the deadline is is it April April 1st 11:59 midnight PM. April 1st um, so I as mr. Hawkwood had mentioned I'm thinking about even possibly having um, public meeting on on this and and bringing in stakeholders um, we do have the principal's um, district improvement plans and um, their wish lists. We, we have those, see how they tie into the, these monies. But I would also, um, through the chair of the committee, think about having a public meeting where we can bring in the, um, the other stakeholders, principals, uh, teachers' unions, uh, to see where we stand. Because as, Doc, it, as Mr. Hockman said, <laughs> I almost did that again. I am a doctor. <laughs> you are, <laughs> technically. <laughs> JD, right? You guys uh, five watch. weeks is, um, <laughs> is not a lot of time. Uh, you know, basically, we're, we're working on a budget before the budget, hypothetically. Um, so I just wanted to get some feedback of everyone else to see uh, what they thought on this. Thank you. Mr. Inotis? Yes, I just want to kind of answer a few things here because what we're really doing is we're submitting a three-year plan to DESI on how we're going to correct 
and aim at targets for some of the disparities we have. We actually, with this, once a plan is submitted, yes, it has to go to DESI and they need to sign off on it. But if DESI says no, we can go in and amend the plan to meet their standard. So I just want to make that clear. Once we submit something, it's not as if that is etched in stone and we can't touch it. We do have an opportunity to go in and amend it and work with them and go from there. So I, I don't I don't want to be too fearful about things that, you know, it's it's locked in stone once we submit something. These are a three year plan on how we're gonna fix some of the issues that in our personal district we're having. Broadly across the street as across the state you have, you know, other districts that are struggling with um, you know, English language learners and things of that nature. So that's where all that kind of came from. So I just want to be clear about that, that once that plan is submitted, it will go to DESI, but we can work with DESI on that plan, and they want it to get us you know, where we need to be. So I just want to make that clear. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kerbel, did you want to respond at all? No, I mean, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. No, that's, and I, I, I brought up Thank you, I have the language. Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Right. I forgot, you know, we can, yeah, amending is always a possibility. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you for that, though. That was a great presentation. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It really is a good presentation. And um, my understanding is that what we're going to be doing on the Student Achievement Act report to DESE, it's in a way it is separate from our budget because these are targeted funds that we need to. Um, we, we just need to show the department what we intend to use that money for and then follow through on that. But that money has to be used for the purposes that we all agree to to utilize it for. And the goal is to close the achievement gap and that's our plan. Mr. Hockman. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. And I agree that uh, I think Mr. Miko brings up a, a great idea of having a public forum sooner rather than later so that we can get uh, stakeholders an opportunity to um, collaborate and provide us with insight on some things that need that they believe need to be accomplished. I just want to be a little careful because we've been throwing this word around a little bit uh, tonight and I think maybe, um, I don't know if it's intentional or unintentional, I, I value the, um, and I think we all do, the input of teachers and staff who are in the classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis and see uh, or, or have a, a better educational understanding as to the impacts of tier two and tier three supports and things along those lines. So I do view this as, as a whole district issue. I'm not quite sure where the union comes in. Because I don't really view it as a union issue. I think it's an in influx of money provided by the state to uh, uh, recognize that there are some deficiencies within certain subgroups that need to be addressed and we have an opportunity to receive those funds and allocate them. And I think that other than union members being educators for the most part or administrators who, uh, like I said, are in the classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis and in the buildings, um, I certainly value their opinion wearing those hats. I don't really see this as a union issue insofar as um, we're not using this money to, um, for contractual obligations for union right. personnel. Exactly right. We're using it for, for generating um, programs and maybe hire people um, to, to, to run those programs and to help our students. But I don't want to get it confused with addressing contractual obligations that we, we have through collective bargaining agreements that were, that were met at um, arm's length negotiations. Dr. Kerbel. No, I, um, you're right. Actually, it's, it's not in, the union is not mentioned in the act, in the legislation. I'm just being polite. No, no, I, I realize okay. that and I appreciate that. I just wanted to be clear. Yeah that, um, you know, we, we, yeah, we got it. Right. And I'll be honest, Dr. Kerbel, I took the use of, your use of the word union, the way that I look at it in this situation that um, the teachers union has two roles. One is that they, that they work on collective bargaining issues and overall though they are probably one of the biggest advocacy group for education that we, that we share responsibilities with and that they, they speak from a position of strength on education. Um, so I didn't see this as anything to do with collective bargaining at all. I just felt that it was the strength of the, you know, the teachers and, and their, their knowledge that they would be coming forward with. Yeah, well, 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 yeah, okay. Final point on Mr. that, if Mico, I may. 
Uh, yeah, Mr. Uh, Miko? Th thank you, through the chair. And, and, and what I did mention, teachers, I also, uh, just going back to the, um, the principal, um, principals when they made their um, presentations on the district improvement plans, uh, I would imagine that they didn't come to those decisions by themselves. They met with their team, they met with their, their, their uh, they met with central office and they met with teachers. So that was, that's what I was bringing up is that it was a collective, collective effort, effort. So I would like to go back to those district, district improvement plans and I would imagine that within those plans, and $1.2 million does sound like a lot of money, but it'll get chewed up pretty quickly with the needs that we have, whether it's, uh, as I can remember, you know, um, social emotional learning, uh, counselors, interven <coughs> in interventions, both in reading and, and in math, that'll get chewed up pretty quickly. So I would think uh, bringing in all the stakeholders, when I mentioned that, I think it's already in the uh, district improvement plans, but I would also be open to a, to a forum because not only, uh, Will it help us for now, but it'll help us for, for future budgets down the road, and, and hopefully there's more monies coming down the road um, with another change of a law or, or whatever. We'll, you know, we'll see. But that's, that was my point when I brought up the, the teachers. I think just because of the, the district improvement plans were made by principals with their teams, with central offices, a collaborative effort, so. Okay. Mr. Anotis? I'm no. good. Okay. Oh, Mrs. Carpenter, I knew I was someone over there. Thank you. Um, so just reviewing, so the 1.2 for the Student Opportunity Act, I just want to um, comment, you know, Dr. Kerbel had mentioned meeting with various stakeholders, which I think is a, is a great idea. A lot of the points that I wanted to talk about, Mr. Amico had mentioned, our, our school improvement plans already identify deficiencies from some of our major stakeholders. I am not opposed to having a public forum. Um, I am not opposed to Dr. Kerbel meeting with them. I honestly don't think it's that big of an issue. I'm pretty sure we can spend 1.2 million and we already know where we're deficient and we talk about it year after year after year. I think we're all gonna come up with pretty much the same answer. I think we already know the answers. I think it's common, it's, it's a courtesy um, and to let you know, people be heard about this money but I don't think it's gonna be that difficult to figure out where to put the 1.2 million dollars. So. Any way you guys want to do it is fine with me, but I, I think it will, um, it, it should be fairly quick. <laughs> I agree. We could probably do it right now, but I'm not going to do that. I could tell you right now where to put but I'm not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank okay. You. And Mr. Hawkman? Thank you. You're all set? Okay. All right. Okay. Moving along. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. We're moving on. Mm -hmm. So field trips. This is the high school students to Nashua South New Hampshire High School. And um, did you mind talking to them a little bit? Yeah, sure. The, um, the, Lord? the I think, I don't know what the depth of the conversation is or what's appropriate. There's, there's some collective bargaining associated with this activity. There's a um, parent teacher student organization that's had two or three meetings already at the high school. And one of the um, things we're looking at is a event during the school day called Tanner Time. It speaks back to our NEASC visit that we had in uh, September and the need to personalize the high school. There is a very successful program going on at Nashua South and the teachers involved uh, in, the student, uh, in the PTSO want the student voice. We want to see what they think about what this event looks like. We had um, eight or ten teachers go up to Nashua South about a month ago to look at what they call everything block. It's a, like an academic enrichment block. It's a time frame during the school day that has um, a teacher mentor for every student in the building. They meet every Monday and for the other days of the week during that time frame, they, the teachers capture students and get extra help and they, um, they, maybe the band pulls them together. There's a whole bunch of things that happen during this time frame. Anyway, that's what this field trip's all about. The kids are gonna go up and take a look at it, see what the kids think. Um, that's why we're sending them up there. And we took a really good cross-section of the student body, a couple of student leaders, but the teachers did a really nice job of selecting a good cross-section of the student body to go and check this out. And it's a one-day trip, probably gonna happen on March 9th or 10th. But it is, it is out of state, so we have to bring that to you guys. It's a one-day trip. Oh, motion to approve. Oh, yeah. Second. Okay, motion by Mr. Arnotis, seconded by Mrs. Carpenter. Discussion, Mr. Hockman. Thank you, through you to Dr. Lord. Thank you for putting this on our agenda and putting this trip together. I think it sounds like a 
fantastic opportunity for a lot of people involved. Um, I historically vote to abstain from uh -huh. field trips um, for a variety of reasons. So I will just do, would say that I think it's a worthwhile trip. My vote doesn't reflect the um, trip itself. I also would again caution, we're throwing terms out there like impact bargaining, and I would caution whether there's a need to impact bargain for this or not. Um, and perhaps, you know, we do have counsel. We should talk to them before we start throwing some terms around, just okay. as a cautionary measure. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. All right, we'll do a roll call vote. Yes. 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 Abstain. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, next. Um, I want to talk to you about the EpiPen ca cabinets. So, um, the EpiPen cabinets was, a, was piloted in the public school, BB Public School, several years ago, and that it was initially proposed by the um, Asthma and Allergy Awareness Initiative and adopted by the school committee. Um, so, I believe that, that during the fall, um, Brenda Wolf and Sharon Cameron and Cameron Murtag, the superintendent at the time, um, made the recommendation that the pilot be concluded several reasons. One, they can't get EpiPens. Secondly, they have to be a prescription. Okay, and that sounded like the AE, was it the um, AEV, where something happens, you can apply the, the paddles. No, you have to, you, you, you can't do it the same way. So we can't get EpiPens, they have to be prescribed. And, um, and they have to be um, provided to a school nurse, okay? So I'm gonna read this. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest issue is we are unable to provide EpiPens for the cabinets. The National EpiPen for Schools program run by the EpiPen manufacturer did supply us with initial set of pens for these cabinets, however, Due to the ongoing issues with EpiPen availability, they are no longer able to provide those. Okay, so I mean, this, I'll make this, um, make sure that each, each of you get a copy of this. I don't think I have a, nope. I'll make sure you get, you'll be sent a copy. All right, but the EpiPen pilot is no longer in operation. Okay. And, and, um, uh, the year that it was in operation, it uh, wasn't used once. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. I'm going to go uh -oh. Mrs. Carpenter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, through the chair to uh, Dr. Krubel, um, the letter that you were reading from that said they are no longer available, um, who is that from? It's from, uh, it's, it's from Brenda Wolf and Sharon Cameron. Okay, so they're saying that they're unable to get EpiPens from the free resource that they had previously. Right. Okay, so um, in my opinion, what that means to me is we're going to ask someone else for the EpiPens. I am in no way, shape, or form um, ready or <coughs> would I be able to let this go. I don't even consider it a pilot anymore at this point. I'm not sure why it's even called a pilot. We've had it for so long. Um, and I think that um, we need to check other resources to get these cabinets um, stocked. So I'm not sure, you know, there has to be other ways to get it. And, and I, I do realize that you said that there has to be a medication order for them. We, right. we covered that. We, we covered that hurdle before. We had a um, physician write out the prescription and, and we, we've we tackled this issue. We have forms up next to the EpiPen cabinet so that they can be administered to the students that need them and they're covered for HIPAA laws. And I just can't believe we're talking about this again. We've, we've handled every single issue to make sure these cabinets can stay in the buildings. If we just need to restock them, then we will find a way to restock them. I, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I need to be passionate about this, okay? So let me just- How'd you know? Uh, well, I, I know. Oh, it's, okay. it's okay. Go I ahead. Knew the committee would be would be passionate about it. Yeah. Okay. Because I I, um, I understood what you went through before. Let me just let me just read um, under state law, pharmacies require a prescription to provide an EpiPen, and a prescriber must write a prescription in the name of an individual for whom the prescription is intended, meaning that the city physician cannot write a blanket prescription 
for the PB Public Schools. We have conferred with the city physician and with the state health department trying to find a workaround on this for the past two years with no success. Please note, there are no other school districts in Mass running a similar project and so no other stakeholders looking to tackle this issue. Just, would, I, would, would you like me to invite um, uh, Sharon, Shannon Cameron, and um, Brenda Wolf to the next meeting? Oh, definitely. We should, yeah, keep it on. And, and, but I'm pretty sure, I mean, it was all written, it was all said. I don't understand why it changed. It's Mr. Hockman. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Kerbel. Uh, you know, one of the reasons in my profession, when we have uh, a witness testify, we have them testify in person so that we can question them and ask them about their, where they have the information, get received the information from and, and able to draw our own conclusions based upon the information that's provided. That's our charge. We're the legislative body of the school department, and we get to set policy based upon information that's provided to us both by um, two very talented people, Brenda and Sharon, who, who do their jobs wonderfully well, and teachers and principals and administrators and things like that, but we get to make the decisions as far as the policy. Um, so I would like to see Ms. Cameron, Ms. Wolf, Ms. DiLoretto, who is the president of the Allergy Asthma Awareness Initiative, who brought this to our attention about six years ago, Ms. Carpenter or so, maybe yeah, more. Probably. Yeah, probably, maybe think, even more. Maybe more, so that we can get an understanding as to um, what opportunities are available. Um, I heard out of my ear Mr. Olympio say maybe the laws changed and maybe we're not aware of that and things along those lines that we'd like to, I think, explore before we simply right. put um, an end to a, a policy. And, and I, I'd even make a motion to make it a, a permanent policy and then operate as if it's a permanent policy uh, to explore whether or not there's financial issues associated with um, this that, that are prohibitive or if there are legal issues or medical issues or things along those lines. So I would like to see at least those three, uh, Ms. Cameron, Ms. Wolf, Ms. DiLoretto, and we also do have a city doctor um, who is on payroll. Um, if the city doctor is, if it's advisable, and I'll leave that to the discretion of the superintendent, <coughs> it's advisable for the city doctor to uh, come talk to us as well. Then, then we should have that done. Okay, and Mr. Olympio, then Mrs. Carpenter. No, through the chair, no, I agree with uh, Mr. Hawkman, Ms. Carpenter. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of questions. It'd be great we could have them at the next meeting, so I'd be in favor of that. Okay, Mrs. Carpenter. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I was probably just <laughs> doing my thing. <laughs> okay. Mr. Biko. Thank you, through the chair, and and possibly even our legal counsel. If, if there was a law change, as, as Mr. I don't know if there was. Yeah. We don't know, yeah. but Let's maybe change. we can have our uh, legal counsel look into that as well. Uh, if there was a law change in that, thank you. Dr. Kerbel. Okay, that's what I'm gonna do. So I'll try, I'll get a legal opinion. I'll get that for you. I'll ask. Brenda uh, Wolf and uh, Chairman Cameron, who wanted to come tonight, I said, let me go through this first. Okay. And so I'll, I'll ask them to come. All right. And um, I think that I'm willing to accept what I see, um, the future, but I'm willing to bring these two people here and let you, let you talk to them, let them share with their knowledge, and then I'll bring you uh, some information from our city attorney. Does okay. that work? It does. Um, one other thing, Dr. Kerbel, if you if you could, if you could forward the, the message to the school committee members, that might help too, where it has a lot of details to it. Um, just as a point of information, it's, it's the first I've heard about, about it from, from the email, but I will tell you, over the past few years, just having discussions with Sharon Cameron and Brenda Wolf, they, they really have been battling with the state, and legally, there was no legal way to do this because of the requirement for the prescription. And they said that um, it, really, it really can't be done in, in our district because of the way the state law is written. And so that, that has been the difficulty all along. And they've been trying every, everything to uh, make it happen, but apparently 
you know, they've finally reached the end. Mr. Anotis? Yeah, just a quick comment. Um, I know we'll talk to probably Don Khan about legally where this is, but um, I don't recall any major bills that have come through that have changed the rules on EpiPens, but I do know there are several pieces of legislation floating around related to EpiPens and the availability and the use and all that. So um, that could be the case that it may have been a fight and the state may have Right, the solution said, may be coming from the legislature. But right, it, the it, solution would be, I, right. I'm wondering if it's like the State Department of Health that may have said yeah, something, but we can find all this out, so. Mm -hmm. Mr. Miko. Thank you, through the chair, and chairperson, maybe you know this uh, as, now, um, students that have a prescription, are they, are they bringing their EpiPens in? This yes. is, this is, to point of clarification, this is for extra EpiPens being stored in cabinets. This, right. this, so if, if a student has a prescription, they have an EpiPen, they bring it in, or the parents bring it in, the nurse keeps it in the, in the um, nurse's office. We, mm -hmm. That's not changing. Not at all. This is just extra pens being stored in, in a cabinet. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the original intention with those cabinets was to have like, like an, an AED, that if someone was having a reaction, for example, in a cafeteria, that the EpiPen would be readily available. However, then it became apparent they could not use a, th this is my term, it's not, not what they would call it, but a, like a generic prescription, that a nurse could take that EpiPen out and give it to me if I was having um, an allergic reaction to something. They could not use it on me because I do not have a prescription for an EpiPen. So then it turned into an issue where the only people who could have access or who could be treated with that EpiPen, the emergency EpiPen, would be a student who has a prescription on file with our nurse's office. So then a list was to be kept with the, with, with the cabinet. If someone on that list had a reaction and could not readily get the EpiPen, it could be administered to them. That's the difficulty. And, and thank you, through the chair, thank you, Ms. Sun, for clarifying. And, and I'll, I'll use a, um, a hypothetical that could happen. I know it's happened in other districts. But you have a student who's fairly new to the district. He, could, he or she could be an ELL student, doesn't know that they have an allergy. What happens in that case if, if they, you know, most kids who have allergies know it, but some kids do not. What happens in that case if we don't have a, a spare um, EpiPen available? And do, that, do we have to wait for the, the EMTs or? Yeah, that was, that was the original, the original um, goal, was to be able to make it more available to people, especially people who didn't know that they had an allergy. But then, then it turned out they couldn't do that. And it has to be administered by um, uh, medical personnel who make an, make an assessment at that time. And we had thought it could just be that, you know, someone knew someone was having an allergic reaction, they could use the pen. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Carpenter. And I just want to point out, we, we did have everybody do EpiPen training. Yeah. We sent everyone in the district mm -hmm. to EpiPen training so everyone could administer it. I mean, we, we went really far with this. So um, excuse my frustration, Dr. Kerbel, but for for all of a sudden, I respect Brenda Wolf and Sharon Cameron immensely, so that's why I just feel like I'm lacking information. But for it to just come to a meeting and be so abruptly s stated that it's over is just definitely not acceptable. It, it may be the case, but we spent a lot of time and effort on this, so I think um, we definitely need to have those people come in and talk and explain to us if something legally did change or 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 how we're going to be able to keep it and maintain it no, i just um there was a letter that was an email that was i think was supposed to make its way to the board it didn't okay it, it ended up on it ended up someplace but i thought it was went to everybody but it did not okay so we'll keep this on the agenda right. for the next meeting sure. and bring in um the the public health personnel to, to address us okay Mr. Hoffman? Yeah, thank you. Just last point on this, because I, I, I have the same recollection as Ms. Carpenter on this, but can we also bring in Ms. DiLoretto? Because my memory at that time when we, when we initiated this program was that she was lobbying, for lack of a better word, the state legislature 
and maybe she can provide some insight on some of the things that Mr. Onotis is talking about on where things stand in terms of um, legislation that she was advocating for. Um, we, we could bring, bring her in and, and Mr. Onotis would, would be available too. I'm a resource if we need it and I can try to find out tomorrow as well where we are. And I can, you know, we can work with Dawn as well. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get to the bottom of this, but I do think it might be best because now we have two weeks until our next meeting. Would it be possible to have that read in full just so this is, the public is informed of what might come depending on where we go from here so we have that from Sharon Cameron because I would like to hear that email in full just explaining this quickly if we can. Is that possible to do? I can send that the, the email that I have you talking yeah. about. I, I'll, I guess uh, I might be able to send it to you by the end of the night. Mm -hmm. I can just step off to the side. I, think I have the, I, I, I should be able to find it. I'm, I was CC'd on an email. Okay. 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 That's great. Okay, so we'll hold this for the next meeting, have the invited guests come in, and they can be available. And in the meantime, you'll, you can send out the information that you currently have. Okay. All right. Next item. So this one? I'm going to be I'm going to redistricting. Mayor Bencourt asked for redistricting to be put on the agenda, so I'm just going to table that till next time. I just want to mention two other things. Uh, the Caring and Healing Committee uh, met today. All the captains met. So we're going to have a pizza day for, if this all works out for staff on February 28th. <coughs> so if there are any businesses or, or individuals that would like to sponsor pizza day, we're looking, we, we're going to end up purchasing something, uh, getting somewhere around 220 pizzas wow. for 10 schools. Lastly, I just want to make a comment about the mother and daughter that were here earlier. Mm -hmm. They couldn't make a public comment. I actually can't say much about it. And there's, and there's a reason why, I'll tell you in a second. So there was an incident that happened at the middle school I authorized an investigation. I asked uh, the human resource director to look into the matter, uh, which he did. He gave me a full report. And uh, I think maybe there's some lessons learned, but other than that, I think that the law was followed. There was no violation of any laws or anything else like that. There were some lessons learned which First thing I'll be doing is talking about that tomorrow with our principals and then working with our law enforcement about that. I think that the policies and procedures set forth by the school committee were followed. Um, I do, and, I, and, and I, I did communicate with mom, then not so much with the daughter. Offer my apologies. And so publicly I offer my apologies to um, uh, the family that was here if they felt any anguish or felt uncomfortable. We want everybody to feel comfortable in our schools. We want them to be supported. And so if they feel uncomfortable, you're able to come here and publicly express that. Gee, I'm sorry they feel that way. Right. And that's, so I won't make any comment about it afterwards to the press or publicly because it's a it's personal issue. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Krabbel. Okay, uh, written communications. We have two communications in our package. These are letters from the department commissioner, Jeff Riley. The first one is regarding the 180-day waiver request, which was denied, and the communication regarding the critical shortage waiver, which was allowed. Um, the 180-day waiver request was submitted um, seeking to have one day waived from our uh, calendar and that was the day that we closed the district so that uh, staff and students and families could attend Ms. Murtag's funeral. The critical shortage waiver was to allow us to hire Dr. Kerbel um, as he is, was <coughs> retired. We brought him back. <laughs> so 
Are there any questions? Mr. Hoffman? Yeah, I just want to go on the record as stating, stating that I'm disappointed in uh, Commissioner Riley for his denial of our request for a waiver for the 180 days. Thank you. Anyone else? Me too. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Moving on to subcommittee reports. Education subcommittee. No report at this time. Okay. Finance subcommittee. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, the finance subcommittee met last week. Um, we met with Mr. Scanlon and um, Dr. Kerbel to get an update on the budget and in what direction we're heading. Um, and at that time, Mr. Scanlon had uh, discussed with us the possibility of doing a uh, transportation audit. Um, there is a cost to that, and we advised him to um, prepare something, and we would bring it to the committee as a whole and see how they felt about this. Um, I believe this paper was passed out right at the start of our meeting, so I'd like to make a motion to accept. Okay. And this does um, spell out pretty much um, what he's asking for, and if I can ask through the chair if Mr. Scanlon can speak to it. Sure. Okay. So this was a, a motion to motion to receive, seconded by Mr. Adotis, and I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Scanlon. Okay, as you uh, review the memo, I'll scan through it. Um, there is a Massachusetts Association of Pupil Transportation, MAPT, and we've been in touch with them. I'm familiar with them from my prior districts. Uh, it's an association that's uh, run by current and retired uh, transportation directors, and uh, they provide uh, many services. One of those, primarily, is a review of transportation services within the district. So I contacted them and they gave, uh, sent forward a transcript of uh, the scope of work of what it would take, uh, three different forms. We have to provide a lot of data, uh, do different things. So we reviewed it with um, Mark and Chris. And I talked about it with Lisa Connor, who is our director of transportation. She's very excited about the opportunity to do it. I mean, you, you probably know the history. We had a, um, a turnover, unfortunate loss of an individual that had a lot of institutional knowledge. And um, Lisa is, is in that spot. She wants to do well at it, but that's not her you know, history. So uh, she's looking forward to any insights that she can pick up. So in that um, they described what they would do is review the transportation practices, staffing levels, assessment of procurement, scheduling, reporting, payroll, <laughs> right on through, and then make a recommendation, a written report, uh, which would come to the school committee, uh, pluses and minuses, and some recommendations. So what I did is I asked for, and I uh, checked on three references. I only got two of them back yesterday. That's why, you know, we just gave this to you at the last minute. So our, our neighbor, um, Kristen Shaver up in Salem, strongly recommends MAP. They're very happy to talk about it in detail, the cost that they did two years ago on a $7,200 uh, $7, on total budget of 2.8 for a percentage of uh, 2.5. So the percentage of the overall program was just something that came up during the finance committee, so I decided to continue to use that as a reference. Um, April is over in Gardner. I know her. She uh, spoke very highly of the review that they did there last week. They uh, MAP helped them put together a bid package, uh, res resulted in significant savings for their transportation bid. Um, their transportation program is 1.4 million. Their cost last year was 8,000, which is a higher percentage. It's uh, 0.56, half of 1%. So. And then uh, over in Lemonster, Glenn uh, Frodo, who I know and Chris knows, and um, spoke by the hand of MAP, spoke along 20 minutes about all the positive things they did. One of the things that he stressed is they rebuilt all of the bus routes for Lemonster and proved them to be uh, much more uh, efficient. So their ratio was um, a transportation budget of four million, one nine five hundred, and that's the equivalent of. 20, 0.22. Ours is in the next paragraph. It's 9,000 if we uh, go with them, and our budget's roughly 4.8 million, which is the lowest of the four. It would be 0.2%. Uh, so now we get to the part of the memo that's probably the most surprising part as you read it. 
Um, we have an account in the, the SPED, uh, I'm sorry, in the transportation appropriation that has ended with a surplus to significant surpluses in each of the last four years. And I just wanted to explain that. What happens, surpluses that show up, they often show up at the end of the year when chargebacks are applied, when purchase orders are closed. This account is a, a variable account. It's special education contracted services, which are for transportation of students that are placed at outside agencies. Those placements change. They come and go. We build the budget at the beginning of the year, and then students move in and move out. So one of the things that I can guarantee you is you'll know as we head into March, April, May, where we stand on an account like this. We won't go right to the end of June and then find out that we have a surplus, just like we wouldn't want to go to the end of June and find out that we have a, a deficit. So I said, that's probably the most surprising part of this whole memo is that that one account did have a couple surpluses. So my recommendation is there's, uh, that we would use that account uh, to cover this um, contract for this year if you approve it. So then the bottom of the memo, if you agree, I just put some sample warning for the resolution. So anybody have any questions on this recommendation? Yeah. Mr. Olympio? Yeah, through the chair. So, uh, so how are we looking this year currently in this particular mm -hmm. um, account? Where, where do we stand? Is it As of right now, that's, yeah. um, the, it, this is pushes the account into, into deficit. Okay. So, it, but it's the nine thousand dollars. It was e it was at an even keel, so I would have to be responsible for finding it. There's about fifty other accounts, you know, okay. that it could come from between contract services. And probably not fifty, sorry, thirty yeah. uh, within the transportation appropriation. Okay. Mrs. Carpenter, thank you. Through the chair uh, to Mr. Scanlon, in these. Um, recommendations of when when you spoke to Salem Gardner and Lemonster um, I see that you have provided information on what their cost was but has any of them told you what their savings ended up being or their end result of this audit other than I think somebody just mentioned some there was some efficiency which is should but was there a, a number associated to any of these? Well, many of the districts, I'm not quite sure I heard your question, but let me just try this answer, is that many of the districts have a combination of uh, services that they contract out and that they run in place, and then they do some special ed transportation, mostly contract out. Ours, my impression is we tend to do more in-house than I've seen in, in other districts. So what MAP will do is they will customize the, uh, what the analysis will be. We can actually go to them and say, we want you to look at these three things. The way that their work is performed, they would come in, they would do the work. Um, we probably would pay them up front, but we won't pay the final bill until we get the report back that we want. And if the report doesn't say what we want it, if it didn't look at what we want it to, we would just tell them, before you submit your final bill, go back and look at these things. Again, I apologize. Did I address your question, or was there something else that? Did, did they see a, a cost savings after the audit? The, did they see the cost savings? Did any of these districts <coughs> a reduction in the cost of their buses as a result of this audit and the restructuring of their bus routes? Uh, just the one uh, that highlighted the bid. Uh, I think they stressed in um, being more efficient in the operations. Um, I didn't ask for anything specific in terms of cost reductions. I can go back and clarify. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was one definitely that received better pricing from the bid based on MAP's involvement. So I, I guess I have two questions then. Um, one is what um, prompted this to be brought forward? And two, is this something that essentially we have people in the district that should already be able to audit our own transportation system because that's their job anyway to to make it most efficient uh, well it came from um, two places primarily uh, one in my I had a discussion with Kara about it and I suggested to her that th this type of service did exist uh, we felt that it might be worth looking into because of uh, the turnover in that department 
And so when I approached uh, Lisa and talked to her about it, this was before really I even approached, it was a while ago, uh, she was very upfront and very upbeat about it. So during the next period of transition, I spoke to Chris about it, brought Mark up to speed about it. So it was something that they did not approach us. I was familiar with them. I've used them in another district. I did approach Kara about it. She thought it was a good idea, just in a conversation between she and I, and then I just kept looking into it a little bit further. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Hoffman? Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the work you've done in this, Mr. Scanlon, and I'm in favor of um, having an outside agency on uh, programs that were, or departments that we operate um, just to see if there are efficiencies. I mean, this issue um, came up with regard to our, and we talked about it a few years ago, I want to say, about um, the uh, limits that we place by policy on transportation um, at the various uh, grade levels. And, you know, this is something that an organization is able to look at to see if, I mean, we've, you know, talked about buses passing neighborhoods that had um, seats available on the buses, but uh, due to time constraints because of the three-tiered system that we have, we're unable to um, stop and pick up kids so that mm -hmm. we can reduce the distances by which kids are able to receive transportation. Um, perhaps that's a benefit that we get out of this if there are efficiencies within the routes um, that are, can be identified by an outside agency. So I, I'm all fa in favor of this, and after Mr. Miko speaks, I'll be happy to make the motion. Thanks. Mr. Miko? Sure, thank you, through the chair. The word, to me, the word efficiency means is something working better, is something working better on time, and a simple formula, time equals money. I, I would imagine if, if this goes through and we're paying our $9,000 and we get more efficiency, Hypothetically, there will be a cost savings. I'm just putting a simple formula together. Like I said, efficiency is something that works better, better on time. So I, I would hope that there is a, uh, a cost savings to this. That's just my. If I could comment, sure. it's the better efficiency is one that we are particularly interested in because um, the transportation leases of the opinion we need to add a bus for next year. My position is let's look at the bus routes. You know, we think half the buses we see are, you know, half empty. Let's look at the efficiency of the bus routes to determine whether or not, you know, we can put more children on and basically drop them off on a routine basis. Okay. Um, Mrs. Carpenter, then Mr. Miko. Thank you. Um, I'm never, you know, it's not that I'm not in favor to audit our systems or to double check ourselves. A couple of things I'm concerned about and I'd like to know is um, how long do they stay with us for? Because they'll do an audit. Um, is, it, is an audit where they kind of train the trainer so that Lisa will know how to do this in the future? Because essentially our bus routes year after year are moving targets. Things change, you know, kids graduate out, kindergartners come in. This is something that's constantly changing. So if we're going to spend the money, um, how long do we get to retain their services? Do they explain how they've done it so that that knowledge is then passed on so we can continue that model um, for when children graduate, children move in, children, you know, um, any of those type of things. So it, that's just my concern, that we're going to, to be able to successfully keep their audit long term. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Miko? And, and through the chair, and, and thank you, Ms. Carpenter, I, I, I agree with you, especially, I mean, you know, let's face it, redistricting was on our agenda tonight. Uh, you know, so we bring this company in for $9,000, they do the audit, and then 18 months from now, we're in the same situation of moving buses around hypothetically. So to, to Ms. Carpenter's point, will our staff be trained and be able to do what this auditor has done? Because I, I wouldn't want to have to pay another auditor 18 months from now or two years from now another nine to $10,000 to do it again. So I guess that's, that's my point on that. Thank you. Mr. Scanlon, do you happen to know the answer to the questions? Well, I, I, 
can respond from my personal experience, not with this audit, but with other audits that I was involved in. I'm personally committed to fulfilling all of the recommendations of any audit that I'm involved in. I would provide written reports on a monthly basis, following through on each one of the points, explaining the steps taken, uh, the next steps to be taken. Um, this is something that I firmly believe in because if the organization paid money to have an outside you know, professional take a look at things, um, so that's my first um, response. I think th the time on task, uh, we, something that we could require of them, whether or not we physically wanted them here to interview and discuss, to have them come to the school committee, you know, verbally present the report, I think is a definite. Um, so we can take a look at those things. And as I said, we can give them the parameters. Um, you know, I didn't address the question directly. We can tell them we want you to look at our budget. Tell us about the cost. Tell us about the buses. Tell us about the turn. You know, we just need to know what you see and what you recommend. <coughs> um, number of riders is always an issue. So that's a given that they're going to address that. So, so those would be my recommendations is put the burden on them to provide a good audit and then you put the burden on me to follow up on it. Okay. Um, Mr. Olympia, yeah. and yeah, then through Mr. the chair. I mean, listening to everything, I probably would, uh, for lack of a better word, take that chance and go with this audit if there's a chance. So if we're going to spend a, some money to save the number of buses, even for next year, mm -hmm. I mean that could be uh, what a ninety thousand dollar pickup right there. Um, I mean, it's roughly forty five thousand per uh, bus. So okay, right. So. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, going forward, you'd like to think that maybe, uh, you know, the department will become more educated and more well-versed in dealing with, uh, you know, numbers changing and things mm -hmm. like that. So maybe, because, again, this was another area where tragedy hit us, and, um, and there was a lot of our knowledge that, you know, disappeared, so to speak. And uh, so, yeah, I would be in favor of uh, taking that. Uh, taking this position and maybe getting the audit because if it's going to help us even in the short term, it sounds like because if we do have buses where they're not full, to me that's, you know, that's that raises a question to me. You know, are we using, are we being as efficient as we can? Yeah. So, I would be in favor of this motion. Okay, and then Mr. Miko. Thank you, through the chair, Mr. Olympio asked a question about how much could be saved and, and the possibility of maybe forty-five thousand dollar a bus, a bus. So um. I'll be in favor of, uh, of this motion. Okay, all right. And just my own um, opinion, but I've always learned a lot from any of the audits that we've had done in our district and use those as a guide going forward, um, the comprehensive district review, for example, or any, any of the other reviews or audits that have uh, been utilized. So I think that it would help with, with the transportation department. And another thing that I'm thinking of is one of the issues with the um, change in start times was the biggest issue at the time was transportation. Yeah. And if there's any efficiencies to be learned through this audit, yeah. it may be information that we will be able to better utilize going forward and making yeah. plans for that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Hoffman. Thank you. Um, I will make a few more comments before I make a motion. I think it's always healthy um, to have our programs audited periodically at any business, any any operation. I mean, I think it's just healthy to have an outside uh, organization look at how we operate. And um, I mean, we do it with the high school. We're going through it right now. Whether you call it accreditation or auditing, it's really the same thing. I mean, it's an outside agency who's, you know, pe peeling away the curtain and looking at the the efficiencies of the operation. In regard to efficiencies, you know, one of the things I was, I've was, i always been concerned about in terms of our transportation is having bus stops under streetlights. And I don't think that that really takes place all the time. Um, and that's one of the things I'd like to see. I mean, a lot of our kids are standing uh, on corners in the darkness half of the school year, um, our high school kids in particular, because of the time we start school. And, you know, just for safety reasons, I'd like to see if we can, you know, manipulate the routes so that they... Um, are in the safest possible places. I think that that's an efficiency. We might not see a cost savings, but I think we all mm. develop a little more comfort as a result of that. So with that being said, um, and, and I did want to finish up on the point that the 
um, expenditure of $9,000, which I think will bring processes, Ms. Carpenter, through the chair, um, that will allow our transportation department to um, glean a tremendous amount of information from and utilize in the future. I mean, I think that that's it's just information coming that, that I think that the report, I suspect the report will allow for manipulation over time with numbers of students and um, school times and things along those lines. But in closing, I will say that this $9,000 expenditure that's being asked of us in our approximately $80 million budget is a little more than one ten thousandth of a percent. I mean, it, it's really in, in the, it's a lot of money, don't get me wrong, but in the big scheme of things, in, in our real scheme of things of $80 million spent a year, we're talking about a, it's zero, 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 one, one, two, five, percent. I mean, it's, so I'll make a motion to follow the recommendation of the business manager to um, appropriate $9,000 to engage uh, MAPT to uh, conduct a uh, transportation review um, during the 2019-2020 school year, which I assume means we'll have a report by the end of the school year. So moved. Second. Okay. For the motion by Mr. Hockman, seconded by Mr. Olympio. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Carpenter, is there anything else for the Finance Subcommittee? No, not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. School Safety Committee. Uh, nothing new to report. Okay. Athletics and Wellness? Nothing new to report. Uh, oh. I just had a question Michael. through the chair. Sure. Um, Mr. Hockman, could you find out through um, maybe uh, our athletic director, Bua, um, whether or not there is a girls freshman lacrosse team? And if not, if we can get some information regarding that. Please. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Mr. Rico. Okay. Um, Quality and Standards Subcommittee, if you could, the draft <laughs> that's included in our package tonight for a second reading, there is a correction that didn't make it in, and that was my fault. I did not get it in to Ms. Maccarelli quickly enough. If you could look down to the second from the last sentence, it, read, it should read, students failing to follow this policy may, just cross out the word shall, may be referred when necessary to the Peabody Police. So um, I would like to bring this forward uh, for a second reading, uh, the policy regarding bicycle rider safety and responsibility. So moved. With, with the correction, so moved. Second. Thank you. Actually, I can't make a motion. I'm the chair. Can someone <laughs> from the subcommittee, I'll Mr. Manuel? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's try. Nobody would have caught it if you didn't say anything. <laughs> it's your meeting. <laughs> oh Thank you. Okay. So you've heard the motion by Mr. Anodis, seconded by Mrs. Carpenter. Is there any discussion? Okay. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 Thank you. Um, the next one, the uh, liaison to parent and student advisory boards. Just to let folks know, um, the um, Safe Schools, Safe Routes to Schools representative is setting up a presentation with uh, Mr. Busey. It will be for the students here at Higgins. And I'm trying to coordinate with her. She'll be in the district that day, and hopefully I'll be able to have a parent advisory board that night, and parents can speak with her about the initiatives her office follows through on with safe routes to school, safe walking routes, the safety of students as they come and go from the buildings. And uh, I don't have a date yet, but it will be coordinated. Okay. Building and Grounds Subcommittee, Mr. Meekle. Thank you, through the chair. Um, we had a, a meeting earlier tonight. Um, Ms. Dunn um, earlier gave an update on the Welch School of Feasibility Appropriations, so thank <coughs> you on that. Um, this Thursday night, a couple of nights from tonight, um, city Council, there'll be a City Council meeting for a vote on the um, student um, statement of interest for the West and the South roofs. Um, so that'll be on Thursday evening at 7 o'clock at the Wigan Auditorium. 
And um, the Building and Ground Subcommittee is recommending a statement of interest for both the Welch and, excuse me, for the, both the Center and the Peabody Veterans Memorial High School. And um, Ms. Dunn, if you would, on your end, could you make um, a motion? Or? I would say that uh, for that state, those two statements of interest that, uh, I know Dr. Kerbel has already started working on that with staff, so uh, we will bring forward that uh, appropriate language probably at the next meeting. Okay. Um, we're, we're trying to time that because uh, it's not due until April, okay. but because we have to take a vote here and then submit that to the city council, we need to walk it back from the April submission date and then be able to um, make sure that we have enough time built in for the city council to debate the issue, and then we start it off. So that will probably come up at the next meeting. And then as far as the uh, statements of interest on the roofs, um, they will be submitted on, on Friday. Friday. Friday morning. Through Friday the morning, okay. yes, after the, after the city council vote. Okay. And we're, hope, we're, we're anticipating a favorable vote from the city council. I hope they're all listening. <laughs> so through the chair, do you want to, we'll put the center and the and the high school on for the next meeting. Yes, that okay. would be good. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Special Education Parent Advisory Board. Yes, uh, thank you. We are meeting here tonight. I mean, tomorrow night. Uh, pretty soon to be tonight. <laughs> Just stay here, John. <laughs> yeah. uh, tomorrow night, Wednesday, uh, six o'clock, right here at the Higgins, and Dr. Kerbel is uh, going to be a special guest. If He's still available. Um, that's it. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Mr. I notice anything with the liaison to City Council and Legislative Delegation? I have nothing new to report. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. New business. Mr. Hockman, the King Street 40B project. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. I'll try to be quick. Uh, the hour is getting late. Um, I submitted a letter to each of you via email um, for review. Um, I think we're all aware of the proposal for a 40B development uh, on at 15 King Street. Um, so I've submitted a letter to you for review and hopefully approval so that we as a school committee can include it in the city's um, opposition to the proposal, which is due, the opposition is due next week and the mayor wanted materials collected um, by tomorrow. So any Thoughts or any, and, and I said, as I said in the email, I'm not, there's no pride in authorship for me if there are any corrections or amendments or um, alterations that um, any member wishes to make, we could talk about it. <coughs> and, uh, what my vision is here is for Ms. Maccarelli, after we vote on signing this, is have Ms. Maccarelli um, print this tomorrow and affix our signatures to it based upon our vote this evening. So I'll make if there is no further discussion, I'll make a motion for the school committee to approve the letter in opposition to the uh, 40B uh, project uh, at 15 King Street. So Sec moved. Second. Okay, you've heard the motion by Mr. Hockman, seconded by Mr. Olympio. Discussion? Any questions? Okay, I actually have a question. Um, <coughs> regarding the um, the Mass Housing Finance Agency, do you know to what extent they consider the impact of housing on the schools? Um, I guess through you, through you. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Hartman, yeah. Um, I, I don't know that, uh, I don't know, I couldn't give you any specific information on how the Mass um, Housing Finance Authority weighs any particular um, item that will be presented to them, whether in favor or opposed to a 40B uh, project. Um, I do want to make them aware of things that are identified in, in our letter, um, as I'm not quite sure that they are, and I think that they should have that information um, when making a determination that does have an impact. Not so much, um, and as I've said it's stated in the letter, you know, we're not opposed to housing and we're not opposed to affordable housing. We just have some specific um, concerns within the neighborhood of the project as proposed. And, and those are real that we have to live with. And I want to make sure that the authority is aware of them as well. Okay. Because I know, I, I do remember when we were um, preparing 
the letter for the Welch School, looking into it, it was really, um, we, were, we were able to submit something about the school, but I know that a more pressing issue was the, the actual safety of where the housing right. was, being, was being built. And um, that, that's something I'm, I'm glad you addressed it in number four, because it is such a tight, uh, it, it's a tight residential neighborhood. The traffic is already a concern. And I, I, I agree that um, just adding that incredible volume to a tiny parcel in, in the neighborhood is, is really going to be an awful impact for the neighborhood and for, for our students, whether they live in the neighborhood or they're, they're coming to the neighborhood to attend school. And I think it was a, a really a really big piece that Mass Housing needs to look at. And, and there are, if I may, you, you, by the way, I knew you were at a state um, last week at the ZBA meeting and your daughter Maureen um, read your letter wonderfully uh, in opposition to that project and you hit on some significant <coughs> and key points as far as um, putting a population uh, who is in need of affordable housing in such an environment where there isn't even any green space or, or opportunity to recreate and this is a similarly built project or proposed project and I didn't get into that in this letter but I think that we each have an opportunity and I know a lot of uh, people around the city are writing letters in opposition that talk about things like that you know that, that it's important for children to have um, space available to them so that they can play safely uh, not you know I do talk about in the letter the the proximity of this project to the second um, uh, highest incident of, of motor vehicle accidents right down the hill at the corner of Lowell and King Street, you know, which further exempli or, uh, amplifies the need for green space within the project that isn't present in this proposal. Um, because these kids really can't play on the street due to the dangers that exist on Lowell Street and King Street, that intersection. So, um, but I just wanted to mention to you publicly that I thought that was a, a wonderfully written um, letter and your daughter presented it uh, terrifically. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I know that um, when you um, when you speak to Mass Housing on this issue with the 40B, um, you ha you do have to be very specific to the piece of property that you are that you're addressing. And um, the uh, Oak Street project is is very different than than yes. the one on King Street. So they do have have different um, they do have different impacts. There is just one thing that I that I would like to ask in um, in section two about the structural integrity. Um, I think it's fine to, it, you know, it's fine as it's written. But I would just like to ask if the last sentence could be deleted. Uh, that one, I think it's really um, kind of difficult to say that at this time, and I think that. It, it doesn't help the the purpose, you know. Telling telling them that we we, we know we need a new elementary school, but um, yeah, I don't think that the housing authority will will uh, I, come I, up for that. I'd be happy to delete the last sentence. Oh, in that thank you. And okay. I, and forward it to Miss Macarelli in the without that sentence. Okay. All right. Does anyone else have any input for the letter? Okay. Um, would you like? Well, the motion stands, yeah. so we'll call vote. Yes. 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 And I'm going to sign it in my role as a school committee member. So I can't vote in favor of it, but I can but sign it. If you'd like to step down, I'll take the chair <laughs> and you can vote. No, it's okay. It, yeah. It'll work. It'll right. work. But um, Just call Marge tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I'll <laughs> sign it tomorrow when I'm off duty. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, and then the next item, summer food program, Mr. Yeah. Hockman. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna start talking about this briefly and then I'll hold it for the next agenda because I think the mayor kind of needs to be involved in, in this consideration. Um, summer food program has, in Peabody, in my opinion, um, it, it's being run terrifically. The Citizens Inn and the library have, have operated um, <laughs> our summer program for my opinion, far too long. They do a great job. I have no qualms or, or issues with that. I believe it's our responsibility. They're our students, and we have ample 
um, kitchen space and cafeteria space available to provide food for kids over the course of the summer who don't otherwise have food. I have spoken with Corey Jackson, who is the director, executive director of Citizens Inn about this, and my um, concerns about um, having other organizations take on this responsibility. Um, and we talked about some of the federal um, limitations that exist through the summer food program. And with the, you know, I do have some information on how I think we can not circumvent, but comply with those regulations, comply with those mandates, and still, as a school department, take this on. So um, that's the, the forward to the um, conversation that I'm hoping we can have at the next meeting about this. Okay, so we'll, we'll hold that on to the next agenda. Thank you. All right. If there's nothing else, items for the next agenda can just be submitted. Wanna, just wanna, oh. uh, for anybody who's still watching, Masterworks is on to tomorrow at 7. Great concert, um, the kids. They've been working hard. I go by them every day in the hallways. It's just top shelf. If you want to see a great show tomorrow at the Wiggins, right? Right. At 7 o'clock. Go see the show. It's going to be cool. Yes, it's a lovely tradition. Yeah. It is. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yeah.